I would always hear these stories in my school about some ghost girl. I never took the story seriously and there were so many stories about encounters, which were so creepy. I remember hearing some girls saw a creepy white girl in the dress in my school's parking lot weeping. Another cold wind hitting a girl and hearing some loud screams. I would listen to this gossip during class and I would never thought about it. I just dismissed these as rumors. This happened around 2017. I was aware of the stories, but I didn't really believe in them. My high school was literally a block away from where I live and some friends invited me to go play some basketball at my school. We went as a routine and played every Thursday and Fridays until 7 p.m. We were playing some basketball courts outside the gym. It wasn't until daylight savings when the days were getting darker. We decided to stay longer and mess around at my school. We'd walk around the cafeteria or sit on some benches in some classrooms. No big deal. We were just hanging out. But we would see weird stuff like flickering lights and felt like we were being watched. We made the assumption that it's probably the custodians. It wasn't until I brought up the ghost girl that me and friends jokingly said we were going to go look for the ghost girl. And I got my phone out to see if we could record something. My friend told me about a ghost app, but I dismissed it because I heard a girl say, hi, it freaked me out. Especially since it came from the cafeteria. I ran out and was really afraid to go back. I got these unwelcome vibes and decided to take a break from basketball. I returned again with my friends to go play some basketball. I completely dismissed my experience and just went to have fun. When it got dark, we took a break and began exploring around the school, laughing and just gossiping. We went by the outdoor cafeteria tables and we were looking for leftover food in the trash bin. Don't ask why. And I started hearing the wind whistle. I ignored it because of the nearby airport. We kept digging for trash and we went to the school's auditorium. That's when my friend noticed the whistling too. You guys hear that, he says. We all got quiet and those whistles soon turned into bone chilling weeping. We all ran out of the auditorium and were all spooked. I have it recorded too, but the audio isn't too good. One night I got up from bed to use the restroom and I could hear the weeping from outside my apartment. I kept going back despite me getting scared, but I did stop exploring my high school at night. During summer school, the second floor of my school was going through construction. Me and my friend ran up the stairs and in the corner of our eyes, we saw someone standing in the dark hallway. A dark silhouette was in front of us and we awkwardly ran back. We kept talking about the second floor ghost and had our laughs, didn't take it too seriously. It wasn't until last year I went for gossip and we decided to go to my school and relax. It was around 6 or 7 p.m. We were exiting the school and I kept making jokes about my friend's crush. That was when I felt a gust of wind hit me and I felt like it wrapped around me and pulled me back. I soon had someone yell in my ear, hey, and I screamed like a girl and ran out. I turned and saw no one near but my clueless friend. I was trembling and I didn't want to go back to my school again during the night. This experience still taunts me, especially because my high school is still a block away and I had similar encounters as mine as well. There were many other stories such as teachers and staff talking about their experiences. I stayed quiet most of the time, but I actually have one recording and I sometimes like bragging about it. I do want to visit my school again and talk to some of my old teachers and staff to see if I get any similar stories. I haven't had the time to. So throughout my entire life, I've been a hardcore atheist. I still don't believe there's a God out there, but that's besides the point. I didn't believe that we had souls and I certainly didn't believe in ghosts. Recent experiences, have led me to believe otherwise. I've been together with my current girlfriend for a little over four months. We met through mutual friends. I've been spending a lot of time with her over these past months and it's been great. A month or so back, the freezer opened on its own and something fell out. She goes to put it back and acts like it's a common occurrence. I go to check on the freezer to see if it's easy to open, but you really need to apply some pressure to actually open it. But anyway, I don't really think much more of it and just move on. 
Then one night when we're doing the hanky panky, the TV switches from being set to the PS4 to just regular TV. So some random program turns on. The remote was on the sofa about two meters from the bed that we were on, so there's no way that could have been an accident. After calming down a bit and turning the TV off, we continue, and I kind of forget about it for the time being. When we go to shower, I ask her if she had any idea what could have caused it. She said she did have a good reason, but wasn't sure if she could tell me. She eventually gives in. Turns out she can see and talk to ghosts. And so can two of our mutual friends as well. I felt like my world had turned upside down. I'm a man of science. How can ghosts be real? It doesn't make any sense to me, but now there's no way they aren't. If it was just her, I'd probably think she's crazy. Since then, she's met my parents and talked to them about it too. We also visited my grandma, who's had a lot of problem with ghosts. I just thought she was old and probably just seeing things. And she confirmed that there was a lot of activity there. She's also been to my place and says that there were about five to six ghosts there, four of which are connected to our family in some way. This is just so crazy to me. Anyone else here who's 100% sure that ghosts do in fact exist? I grew up in a house that's well over 100 years old by now. It used to be a barn and got converted into a proper Victorian home at some point. When we renovated it, we found horsehair in the walls. Between literal animal trimmings being inside and the activity I experience, I've always felt like the house has a wildness to it. Before we moved in during the summer of 2000, my grandfather owned the home. When he owned it, there were old portrait paintings that felt like they followed me across rooms. And when adventuring upstairs, a place he rarely went due to old age, it felt like uncovering another time. The bedroom that eventually became mine was a military room filled with antique soldier uniforms and other items that I never fully learned the stories from. The rest of the floor had loads of other objects just like that. Simply put, the house had all of the ingredients for residual hauntings. To top things off, my grandfather ended up dying in the house, and that's what led to my family and I moving in shortly after. It wasn't long before I'd hear footsteps from upstairs during the day, or even in the hallways at night when everyone else was asleep. The footsteps could become so relentless that they'd even pace at the front of my room at times. Exhausted, I'd ask the spirit to please stop and make sure I never slept with my back to the room. Due to the footsteps mostly being upstairs, I was particularly creeped out up there. But when I was a teenager, our computer was at the top of the stairs in a little loft by the landing. Nothing, not even creepy footsteps, could keep me from updating my aim away message and video chatting with my boyfriend at the time. While happily tapping away at the computer, the entire upstairs was to my back. I always made sure all of the lights were on to help me better cope with the feeling of being watched. One evening, I was alone upstairs as I video chatted away. I was laughing so much that I wasn't thinking at all about the room behind me. It was at that moment that I felt the unmistakable feeling of a hand coming down on my left shoulder and firmly resting there. It was so fast, I didn't make a sound. Wide-eyed, I grasped my shoulder and twisted my neck to see who was there. No one. My head spun back to the screen and I asked my boyfriend if he saw who was behind me. He said he didn't know. The video cut out right before I turned my head. I was around eight. Me and my family were living in New Orleans. I was playing in the area outside my house and I noticed this older Haitian man who lived a few houses down was sitting under one of our apple trees. We were so close that I would occasionally go play cards at his house since he lives alone and my parents thought he was lonely. The man was in a wheelchair and I sat down near him and talked to him. He gave me an apple but it was incredibly sweet and unlike anything I had tasted before or since. We talked a bit and he told me that he will see me again and walked away. Later that day we found out he had died the night before. And even later in life, 
I found out the man was some sort of voodoo priest from his grandfather, who I was friends with. She also claimed to see him from time to time. This story did not end here, as I saw the man a few more times. We would talk, and he would always give me an apple. I even continued to see him, th though we moved out of the countries around four more times, he stopped showing up. When I entered middle school, I chalked him up as my imaginary friend. I saw him again in the crowd at my high school graduation. I looked at him, a Donny disappeared. As I was into voodoo at this point, it didn't faze me much, and I realized he may have been more than an imaginary friend. The last time I saw him, and the most recent time, was two years ago. I was in a really, really dark place. I was in a crappy job, and my girlfriend had just left me. I was really depressed and was battling with alcohol and other illicit substance addiction. I was actually considering ending it all. And right as I was going to drink a bunch and probably jump off my balcony, I saw the man on the couch. He told me that he'd missed seeing me, but knew that I'd been busy. We played cards, go fish, our old game. He actually got me back down and right before we left, he said that if I gave him all of my coke, that he would leave me some apples. I agreed and he gave me a few. I passed out and when I woke up, I still had the apples, but all of my coke was gone. He's one of the main reasons I stopped doing stuff and did not get that badly affected to them. And he probably saved my life. Have you ever felt a shiver down your spine? A feeling of goosebumps? A sense of chill even though you have been to that place for the first time? That's what I felt when I entered my old house for the first time. I have many times had this sensation when I go near a few places and have found that those places are not suitable for residents. But this time I wanted to be skeptical about it just because every member in my family, including me, had fallen in love with it. It had a big backyard, a beautiful garden. It was just perfect. Things went well for months. Days were beautiful, except that I always felt that something wrong was going to happen. I, a messy and clumsy person, suddenly had urges to keep my wardrobe doors closed all the time. It may seem silly, but the people who know me know it's a fact that I always keep my wardrobe doors open, just to get easy access to my dresses. But now, I really wanted to keep the doors closed because I could feel someone standing there, just standing. Though they were just standing there, what I sensed there was absolute hatred. Level of hatred that I've never felt before. Even now thinking about it, makes me shudder. One night I was so tired from my schoolwork that I hit my bed without even minding my surroundings. In my dream, I saw myself sleeping, but what I saw after shook me. I saw what seemed like a small boy, but without a head. At first, he seemed playful, but as he came near me, I felt the same hatred I felt near the wardrobe. Before I could do anything, he started squeezing my throat with his bony yet soft fingers, grip tightened every time I struggled to free myself from it. When those cold fingers tightened, all I could do was scream, but not a single word came. I thought that was the end of me, but it seems like I managed to scream to my mother in real life. My mom came in and saw me screaming and struggling. She somehow managed to wake me up and ask me about it. I was so shocked that I couldn't manage to answer her. Again, after some days, I saw it with my own eyes. I was about to go to sleep, so I switched off the lights and was about to lay down, and that's when I caught sight of it. The same boy from my sleep was standing right at the wardrobe, but luckily for me, his back was turned towards me. I really had to make sure that what I saw was real, so I went near and tried to grab him, but all I felt was cold air pass through the palms of my hand. Terrified, I let out a scream, but before anyone could come, he just disappeared. I told my parents about this, and the next day, they brought a person to clean the house. I felt that after the purification, the house had really brightened up, and after a few years, my dad got a transfer, so he had to move. I didn't have the heart to leave, but I had to. On the day of the move, after packing everything, I took a last look at the house, and no one would believe me. I saw a beautiful child waving at me.
I've always seen things, things some are afraid to see, things some are afraid even to think about. During my younger days, I thought nothing of it, just that it was part of our everyday life. People around me brushed me off every time I told them about it. When I reached high school, I did my research, unable to bear the judgy eyes people gave me. Still found no answer that could make me satisfied. Days went on like nothing happened. I could still feel them. Moreover, I could feel someone looking at me with envy. That was then that I started noticing odd things in my mirror. Every time I look into it, I feel that the reflection doesn't belong to me. Since then, I was afraid to look into a mirror, just a mirror in my bedroom. My mother always sleeps with me, so I always felt safe, but it all changed one night. As usual, my mother and I slept, but that day, I felt uneasy. It felt as if something bad was going to happen. In my sleep, I could feel someone caressing my face. I thought it was my mother, but no, I could feel her right next to me snoring. So mustering up all my courage, I slightly opened my eyes, not fully, just a bit. What I saw that night haunts me even today. I saw myself standing and staring at me. At this point, people would say it was a dream, but I know that I was fully awake. I think you all must know what scared me that day. It wasn't seeing myself, but it's lifeless eyes that looked at me with envy, the same envy that I saw in my reflection. I slowly covered my face with the sheets without making it realize I was awake. Suddenly, I felt a spiky hand touch my eyes, trying to grab them. This moment, I could only pray. I heard a sigh and could hear it leave, so I pulled my sheets down a bit and watched myself go into the mirror. I know it was no sleep paralysis, because of course I was awake and saw it happen before my eyes. You may believe it or not from that day, my mirror is covered. To some, it may be like a story, but to me, it was a nightmare that I still try to forget. Even now I see things, and that's a story for another time. But this is a true story that haunts me. Growing up, and still to this day, I've loved the spooky and scary things. Supernatural and paranormal stories were my favorite to read and watch, no matter how much it frightened me. I was obsessed with ghosts and cemeteries, all things creepy, but not crawly, and the adrenaline of the fright. So when a teenage me was offered to play hide and seek in the largest, very haunted graveyard in my city, I said yes. The graveyard was run by the church that it surrounded. A decent sized cathedral surrounded by a mile of graves each way, just to give you a visual on the size of the place. My friends and I had planned to go on a day we knew no one would be there to kick us out for playing along the graves. The week leading up to us playing the game, it had been storming, bringing cold air down after a heat wave. The day we went was the first day that week it hadn't rained. Wet or not, we had to go now or wait after another week of storms. Because of the chill the rain brought, a thick fog had set over the city. Perfect for a spooky game of hide and seek in a graveyard. We all met up at my best friend's house. We'll call him John, as he lived not even three full blocks away from the place. Now John also loved the paranormal like I did, except he was also a huge scaredy cat, so when we went it couldn't be at night. It was barely past noon when we started that way. A common friend of mine and John's, Hannah, the one who came up with the idea, and my boyfriend Greg at the time, were the other two people to play this game with us. Greg was a comfort for John, as Greg was, and still is, a skeptic of all this. We didn't have much trouble getting in, and after a long minute of walking, we made it to the cathedral. It was still decently bright outside for being a cloudy day with thick fog. But in the graveyard, everything felt darker. Maybe it was because it was littered with as many trees as there were graves, or maybe it was because superstitions were getting to us. But either way, John and A came down with bad feelings. While Hannah was explaining how she will be the seeker first, since she came up with the idea, John whispered in my ear about his bad feeling. Admitting to him about mine, though, would have only scared him more 
and really wanting to do this with everyone. I told him not to worry while I pushed my own instincts aside. Anything for the adrenaline, right? And if anyone sees a ghost, make sure you record it, Hannah had said. Greg rolled his eyes, not saying anything, but he was right. Almost everyone in our city had a personal scary story about this graveyard specifically, but no one had ever provided sufficient evidence. And if a bunch of professionals couldn't capture anything, I doubted four teenagers would be able to. I was about to ask her if this was the point of getting us here when John pulled on my shirt and asked everyone if they heard a noise. Like a little girl giggling, he had said. Hannah laughed excitedly, telling us the story of the little kids rumoured to be haunting this place. But they're just a few of many entities here, she said, happily to the group. John was going to say something else, but Hannah clapped her hands and told us to disperse while she turned around and started counting. John gave me a pleading look, but I returned it with an encouraging smile and took off. I was hoping Greg would follow me so we could have a little of our own fun while we waited to be found. But Greg was a competitive person, so if he was playing a game, he was playing a game. I had behind a few trees, a few large graves, always respectful of where I stopped, before I found the perfect spot behind a museum. Those small buildings for multiple graves, usually no bigger than five by five, those things. The front part faced a main path of the graveyard, but the other three sides had large bushes, almost as tall as the thing itself. And with just enough space between the building and bush for me to hide in, they weren't that thick, but they do a decent job. It actually could have easily fit six people without touching each other in the back. It was one of those spots that was so obvious someone would hide there that the seeker would look past it because it was too obvious, if that made any sense. I was there for maybe five minutes before I heard someone walking towards me. I crouched real low so they wouldn't see me standing there behind the bush. I couldn't see too well, but I could tell that the person walking was a guy. When he got close enough, I heard Greg whisper my name. I guessed he probably had similar thoughts to me. However, I was hiding. He didn't know where I was hiding, and he was walking past the bushes where I could easily and quietly follow him to jump out and scare him. Yes, it would have given me away and he probably would scream, but a jump scare in a thick fog in a graveyard? Too good of a chance to pass. It was like I was being handed to me on a silver platter, the perfect scare. I crept down, walking in a sort of duck walk, following Greg next to him to jump out at the front of the bush on the main road. Just as he started to turn to come around the front of the thing, I sprang up and out, yelling, Boo! I could feel the smile fall from my face as I was met with nothing. There was no scream, no surprise, no reaction of any sort, as Greg wasn't standing there. In fact, no one was standing there. I remember looking around confused but seeing literally nobody. Not even someone trying to hide as a prank on me. Something cold passed through me and I shivered. Maybe I should find a different spot, I remember thinking to myself. So there I was, ten minutes later, in a new spot. Tucked in between a grave and a tree, directly behind it. I kept peering around to make sure if I saw someone. They didn't see me. It was maybe two minutes, if that, when I heard crunching of the gravel that made up the pathways. I peeked over the grave and saw Hannah and John walking on one path over, meaning six rows of graves in between the path in front of me and the path they were on. I quietly giggled watching them each look behind things or up trees, as if any of us would climb, and talking to each other. Greg, Hannah called out in a singing type voice, followed by my name. Like she was taunting us to come out. Didn't she know the rules of the game? I jerked my leg back when I felt something touch it, relieved to see it was just a leaf that scrapped up against me. Hannah and John were now further away, still walking away from me, and I had the brilliant idea to follow them. I figured they'd never suspect to look behind them for me. I had just taken a step when something full on grabbed my ankle and pulled. I'm not sure how it happened, but when it pulled at the same time, I looked down to see what it was. But when the pull knocked my balance off and I fell, my head collided with the grave right above my eyes. 
but it wasn't done when I was on the ground. Oh no. My vision was blurring and I couldn't see what it was, but it started dragging me. I was on my stomach, screaming, pulling up grass and weeds, trying to find something to grip, as I was being dragged God knows where. Hannah and John weren't even out of my sight when I went down. I knew they had to hear me, that they'd come running to help, but they didn't. Finally, my fingers caught the edge of one of those plaque graves, the ones where the stone lays flat on the ground. There wasn't much to help, but it provided me with enough edge to use to pull against whatever was pulling me. The slightest resistance and I was let go. I didn't know if my vision was blurry still from hitting my head or from my tears, but I saw nothing and scrambled up quickly. Running in the last direction, I saw someone. However, when I started running, something else did too, following close behind me. I found Greg first, basically running smack dab into him, who was panicking and looking me over. He told me he heard my screams and ran as fast as he could to get me. He asked me why my shirt and pants were covered in mud and if I knew my forehead was bleeding. One of that mattered to me though, because something was chasing me. And I had said as much, but Greg assured me that when he saw me running towards me, no one was behind me. Game or not, we're finished. Let's go find Hannah and John, Greg said, and he took my hand. I remember just crying the entire way after telling Greg that the last direction I saw them going. It didn't take long for us to find them, and an even shorter time for us to leave. Greg didn't fully believe me when I told him what happened, but he knew me well enough to know that I don't scare, like truly be terrified scare, that easily. He wouldn't say it was a ghost, but he would admit it was something. His thoughts were more along the lines of a crazy hobo though. Hannah was pissed at me. She was mad that I didn't pull out my phone and record anything. Got even more upset when I sarcastically apologized because reaching for my phone was the least of my concerns. Which she countered with, you should have been recording the whole time like me. Yeah, we aren't really friends anymore. John didn't say anything to me besides if I was okay and what he could do to help me. It wasn't until after I was okay that he let me know he had been upset with me. I guess he wasn't all right with me brushing off his concerns and then turning around and getting attacked. Irony or karma on me, I guess. I had gotten a concussion from slamming my head on the grave, but no other damage had been done. And it was another two months after that before I'd even look at what Hannah had recorded. But eventually I did, and I still wish I hadn't. Hannah and John might not have seen me peeking over the graves looking at them, but her camera did. Almost clear as day, you can see my head a little ways off, popping up behind the grave and just behind me, where a huge ass tree was supposed to be, was a very tall and very dark figure, luring over me. Then they continued walking. The camera was slightly swaying back and forth, meaning they weren't really holding it to record anything, but it still should have picked up my screams. It didn't. In fact, you couldn't hear anything. Not even Hannah and John talking. Just a white static noise, even though Hannah's camera was basically new at that point. Hannah eventually sent the footage to our city's local paranormal investigative team, who took one look at it and claimed it was faked. It's been years, but every time I drive by that graveyard, I feel that thing staring at me, waiting for me to come back inside, but I haven't. Haven't gone into any cemetery or graveyard since. And if you do go to one, make sure it's to respect the dead. When I was younger, my family rented an old house that we lived in until I was five. At this point, it's quite hard for me to remember much from that time since I was so young. There are a handful of things that I've been told that happened mostly having to do with me at that house, so I decided to finally share some. My father told me that when I was very young, before I could even walk, I would sit on the living room floor and just stare at something. My eyes would follow something that he couldn't see, until one day. He went to get me my bottle and left me in the living room with a raccoon toy. As he rounded the corner from the hall into the living room, he saw me staring at a glowing ball. It was just floating there and then disappeared. Another time, I was maybe one or two, 
and my older sister was playing with one of her friends. I was in one of those rolling baby walkers, just doing whatever. My sister and her friend were playing with a ball, even though my mom and dad had told her to take the ball outside to throw it around. One of them threw the ball and missed. The ball slammed into a glass ceiling unit and smashed it. I happened to be under that light. You'd think that the shards of glass would hit me somewhere, but it didn't. Even the tray of the walker was clear of glass. It had completely avoided me. My father believes it was the same thing that caused the glowing ball of light. My father is a firm believer in ghosts, having many experiences that are not easily explainable. He's insistent that the house had someone or something in it. A few of his experiences were seeing a shadow in the window in the basement when he was doing laundry. It wasn't a shadow, or feet of something that could have been human, since that window was close to the ground. It was a man's head and shoulders. Another one of the weird things about that house was that my father would smell cherry tobacco smoke in the stairway. Both of my parents smoked at that time, but neither of them used cherry tobacco. We moved out of that house when I was five, and of course moved into a house that was built in the 1800s. Scary place, I won't lie, but it was home. The basement of the place was dirt with a set of boarded up stairs that I never learned where they led to. Next to the stairs was a door that led to another dirt room with one window. I was terrified of that basement. I didn't learn how to do laundry for a long time because of it. Even before anything happened in that house, it gave me a weird vibe. My mother and sister would always joke about the children in the walls. I thought they were just joking around and trying to scare me. It was only later that they told me that they would hear sounds like children playing from the walls. But once they talked about it, it stopped. Great. Totally not scary at all. Nope. Not to mention the number of bats that could just break into the attic whenever they pleased. I only remember one experience from that house. There may have been more, but my memory has really gone out the window. I was alone in that big old house. My mom and dad were at work and my sister was at a Halloween party. It was close to 9pm and I was sitting on the couch in the living room watching some videos on my computer. Just to give a quick picture, the living room was large and I can only remember the couch and the TV. The couch was up against the wall and across from the side of the couch was a window. My sister's door was in the living room as well as the stairs up to my room as well as my parents' room. In the winter, I would sleep on the floor in my sister's room since we didn't have heating and it got ungodly cold upstairs. So I wasn't paying attention, drawn in by whatever I was watching until I heard a noise that made me look up. There was a soft tapping on the window across from me. When I looked up, there was something in the window, a shadow of a head and shoulders. Something in my mind told me it was a young boy. I don't know why. I know it wasn't the reflection of my head in the window because it would have been lit up by the computer screen. Something made me unable to move, either fear or just the difficulty of processing what was happening. It couldn't have been a person. The window was at least 10 feet off the ground. Honestly, glad it wasn't a person. When I finally got the ability to move, I bolted into my sister's room and stayed there until someone came home. I don't think I told anyone for a while until my mom and sister told me about the noises from the walls. We have since moved out and nothing creepy has happened at the places I've lived since then. When I was about 15 or 16, I was doing my Duke of Edinburgh award, which involves camping and orienteering. We pitched our tents in a low valley in the mountains. It was at the foot of Slivdonard in Northern Ireland. Me and my friend carelessly made our guide ropes super long. We made them so long, everyone was tripping over them in the daylight. But the tent was up and we couldn't be bothered to fix it. I woke in the night to footsteps and heard someone brush against our tent. I didn't think much of it, assuming one of the boys was taking a leak and tried to get back to sleep. The next morning, as the aroma of sizzling bacon was filling the air, I asked who bumped our tent last night. Everyone denied it. But someone walked around our tent. A few other people heard the same thing, and the two class clowns or jokers in the group said, we were fast asleep, we didn't hear anything. I thought they would have at least joined in with the I heard it, I heard something, 
trying to freak us out. One of the most sensible guys in our group said, someone walked around my tent, but I noticed they didn't have a light. One of our teachers, who was pitched further away, admitted hearing footsteps too. Our Duke of Ed facilitator finally said, you're not the first group to hear those footsteps, you know. We all turned round, perplexed now. He asked us if we had seen the ice house further down the valley. This was built to persevere ice for food storage before electricity. Yes, we all had seen it. Did you read the plaque on it? I hadn't noticed it. No one seemed to. But my buddy Andrew spoke up. Yeah, for the man who died in it. The facilitator nodded. I laughed it off and headed back to my tent to get my mug for a hot cup of tea and tripped over the guide ropes. It suddenly struck me. How did the person who walked around our tent so close he could touch not trip over the guide ropes? These stories happened to me when I was still in high school. My father had a project in Sabah, and so I had to move along with my mum and younger sister to follow our dad. But he is always outstationed in a different rural area, so when all of these strange things started to happen, we were by ourselves without my dad. All of these occurrences happened in and around our apartment complex, which was located at the end on top of a small hill. We didn't know how much of a mistake it was moving in here, and I'm glad that we no longer reside there. Everything was going fine when we first moved in, but the longer we stayed there, the more experiences we had. And things were heading downhill pretty quick. We kept feeling an evil presence in the apartment, and we could tell that it was full of hate and anger. The energy affected us as a family, and we were constantly arguing and fighting over almost everything. One night, when I was reading a book on my bed, I left my windows open. A while after while reading, I suddenly had goosebumps. And from the corner of my eye, I could see a woman figure with long black hair appear and was looking at me. I stopped reading and just froze in my bed. The figure then slowly disappeared out the window. And for context, we were living on the second floor and there was no way someone could have climbed up and down the window grills that fast and actually peek in through the small grill. My mother adopted a cat and living inside the apartment, its behavior was very unpredictable. At times it would be very calm and gentle, and at times it would be wild and would start to chase me and my sister. It would also stare at a corner of the room with wide eyes and make weird noises. This creeped me and my sister out a lot. One time, my second elder sister came to visit us, and I told her about the scary things that have been happening in the apartment, and she just brushed it off and told us not to be scared. And the moment after she said that, Scratches could be seen on her thighs and we had goosebumps. I believe the entity felt challenged and wanted us to be scared of it. I remember one time when I was walking home alone at around 12am and to get to the apartment I had to walk past a hill. Even though the walkway was well lit it was always unnerving to walk by. Halfway through I heard and saw something roll down the hill to my right. Then I heard laughter coming from those hills. So I walked faster and fortunately that was the end of that. A couple of days after that incident while I was on a bus home, the conductor was looking at the hills when we were passing through and told me that he heard stories of spirits living in those hills and particularly one called Babylon, which was a ghost head that had no body, just the entrails of its guts. The entity was said to be of a human who dabbled in witchcraft and during the wee hours would fly with its head seeking for blood especially from pregnant women, and I was told that these entities also seek out stillborns and would sometimes suck the fetus from the sleeping mother. And the mother wouldn't even realise it. It would often be told by doctors that there was no fetus inside their bellies and it must have been a miscarriage. After listening to the bus conductor that there were these kinds of entities living in those hills, I rarely came back home after midnight just to avoid that stretch of road. Once, when I had to come home late, I was passing by a car that was parked and saw a head inside. At first I thought that someone was waiting in the car, but the engine wasn't running, so I took a closer look and saw that the head had no body attached to it. I looked at the side mirror and couldn't see the head, but saw it when I peeked inside through the window. 
It was facing straight ahead and slowly it started to turn towards me. I ran home as fast as I could and locked the door behind me. I came down with a bad fever the next day and it only got better in a week. A lot of bad things were happening in that area as tensions of the family staying there were visibly strained. My neighbours living below me were constantly fighting as well, to a point where the husband wanted to commit suicide. And on this topic, my family also suffered the same. Let's start off with my eldest sister, who changed her ID address to the apartment X62, and was plagued with so much negativity that she tried to kill herself by swallowing a bunch of pills. But fortunately she survived and was hospitalised. Her life only became better once she changed the address on her ID. My mother was going through depression and was also a wreck at the time. My youngest sister who was living with me and my mum always saw things that I couldn't understand. She was really young at the time and was always afraid to be alone in the apartment. I wasn't spared from the negativity as well and tried to end my life three times during the period I was living in that apartment. My family was falling apart and times were really tough. I always felt abandoned and alone while I was living there, even though I had close friends. Even the security guards were seeing things around the apartment, especially at our block. They would see a woman dressed in white walking around the block and would disappear into the hills. So much negativity, so much suffering was felt during our stay there. It was said that the land was plagued by a woman spirit who committed suicide a while back where the block stood and has been spreading her negative energy and hatefulness towards the tenants there. The management denied all of these, but we knew what we experienced there, and what we saw and felt was real. So to the tenants living there now, I pray that this woman doesn't put you through what we had to go through, as I'm never going back there again. When I was about 7 to 8 years old, my family moved to a new house. We had to move because my dad was renovating the old one, so we had to stay at this new place for the time being. The new house was located close to the main hospital, and within the housing area was a graveyard, an old one might I add. The new house we stayed in used to belong to a small family, and for some reason, they reluctantly sold it to my dad. This will play into what happens after we move in. Weird things started happening during the first few nights of staying in that house. We could hear all kinds of noises like random knocking on the doors, especially the kitchen door. Now to explain a little about the layout. This was a semi-detached house and the kitchen was at the back overlooking a jungle. The whole area used to be a swamp before it was turned into a residential plot and because of this the jungle part of it was thick and had lots of banana trees. So every time you went to the kitchen sink, you would face the jungle, and at night, this was very creepy. More and more strange incidents started happening. Me as a kid used to see shadows passing by the rooms. Hear strange voices and sometimes out of nowhere, I would hear my dad sneezing or coughing when he wasn't even home yet. And I remember after seeing these shadows, I would get sick and had to stay home instead of going to school. Yes. It was that bad and to call that coincidence just wasn't right. One time, when we had some family friends staying over, me and one of them were on our bikes when the rest of the family was in the house just hanging out and playing video games. It was about 7pm and we were told by our mums to come back into the house but we just ignored them and continued playing on our bikes. We dared to ignore their advice due to the fact that my dad was out of station when all of a sudden, I heard really loud footsteps coming from the jungle area, heading towards us. It was the sound of heavy boots, and then I realised that it was marching. I couldn't believe my ears, but I heard it clearly and it was loud. It sounded like a platoon of soldiers, and their movements were in sync. I froze for a few seconds, and when I snapped out of it, I screamed at the top of my lungs calling my friend to run to the main door and get inside. We threw our bikes on the floor and ran for our lives. When we got to the door, it wouldn't budge, and so we screamed for them to open it up. It felt like hours waiting for them to let us in, and I could hear the marching getting closer and closer. 
Then all of a sudden, the door opened and we flew inside the house and locked it behind us. We were all frantic at this point. Then our mums emerged from the bedroom and asked what was going on. So we explained it and all of us got a shiver down our spines. The hairs on our arms were standing and I felt that the spirits were still present outside. Being devout Christians, our mum started praying and decided to go outside to the back of the kitchen to see what was scaring all of us. I must have looked pale as a sheet of paper and my sister stopped playing video games and we all hugged each other. About 10 minutes passed by and our mums came back to the living room with us and they were visibly freaked out as well. So for the rest of the night, we all slept in one room. Many other strange things happened there. My sister also had a weird experience one time when she was watching TV in the living room and there was a knock on the front door. When she opened it, she thought she saw my next door neighbour who always hangs out with me. But when she looked inside the house looking for me and looked back, he was gone. And it all happened in a matter of seconds. So it was impossible for my neighbour to have walked away that fast. My parents found weird things being kept in the house. I can't recall what it was, but it was tied up in some sort of cloth. When we asked the church members, they said that it could be some kind of cursed object to haunt us and make us leave the house. And eventually, we did move out from that place, and thank God, nothing followed us. I believe it was put there by the previous tenants, being how unhappy they were that they had to move out. But the thing that puzzles me the most is, why sell the house if you don't want us living there? And why plant a curse in the house? To this day, I can't wrap my head around it, but I'm glad we moved. Let me start off by telling you about the creepy things that happened to me these past few years, and then I'll get into the backstory. I've been followed by a so-called woman spirit since I was a little kid. I would see this woman dart in and out of the shadows whenever I was alone. This figure would never show herself when there were other people around me, and growing up with this situation has not always been easy for me. I always felt alone and scared as I was too ashamed to tell friends or family, and because of this, I kept to myself and just continued living. Like I said earlier, this woman has been following me since I was little, and even throughout my teenage years it didn't stop. She would appear in my dreams often dressed in a white, as cliche as it sounds. It's how I remembered her. When I was in the shower, I would often feel eyes watching me, and on a few occasions I would actually see red glowing eyes staring intently at me. But as I grew older, I was less intimidated by her presence. Once, I was just so tired of having the feeling of being watched while I showered and saw all those two familiar glowing red eyes. I just lost it and splashed the water from the bucket I was using and started screaming profanities at the thing until it left me alone. I've asked a friend who apparently can see into the spirit world and could see spirits since she was a young girl. I told her about my situation and she agreed to come to my place to have a glimpse of this woman's spirit. I didn't tell her about how the spirit looked, but after her visit, she explained to me what she saw. Long hair, white long dress, and an expressionless face was her description. And at first, I thought that her description was so common, as almost all female ghost spirits have that description, and just chalked it up to a lucky guess, and moved on with life as usual. But after her visit, the spirit became more active, and I was seeing her way more than usual. After about a week, I had a horrific encounter with this female spirit, and was attacked with sleep paralysis. Then, the very next day, my friend met up with me, and told me that she had a vision about me. I had one of the biggest shocks of my life, when she started explaining and it was dead on. She said that this woman started following me since I was a kid when me and my family were on vacation on an island in Borneo. She went on to say that we were all so happy and excited to be there, and she saw me playing soccer with my family and friends. We explored the island and were all having a good time. Then, one of the adults there started jumping down into the sea from the jetty. The water was deep in that area and surpassed my height, so when I jumped in, I couldn't stand on the sand and I started to drown. She saw me struggling in the water 
when suddenly a woman in the water caught me and brought me up to the surface and I was safe again. I was almost in tears when my friend stopped talking and asked me if I was alright. I was in such shock that I couldn't say anything. I knew she wasn't lying because first of all, she didn't know that I played soccer and all my friends know that I don't play soccer. It was after this event of almost dying that I hated that game and wanted nothing to do with it. And how would she have known that I went to an island and almost drowned there? I explained that it was one of our adult friends that caught me and brought me back to shore, but she said that it was partly the spirit of the woman. She somehow knew that I couldn't swim, and until this day I can't swim, even if my life depended on it. She went on to explain that the woman's spirit started to follow me after that, and would be jealous if I were with another woman, which explained why all my past relationships would fail and end up badly. She told me there would be only be one woman who can break the bond between me and the spirits, and only then will I get married. My friend said that when she went to my place, almost immediately, she felt a malicious presence and could feel that the spirit didn't want her to be there. It's been a few years since I last saw the spirit woman who followed me all those years, tormenting me and scaring me. I'm happily married now, and I can only pray that this lady from the island never shows herself to me ever again. The place where I live is a forest area on a small island in Borneo. We've been living here for quite a while, about 40 years or more. This was and still is my parents' place. We were always taught by our late grandfather that the trees have spirits living in them. I think you can call it haunted. He used to tell us that he sees it sometimes, especially in the wee hours when he makes his rounds, making sure there were no burglars or any types of threats towards us. He was our guardian, vigilant and always ready. He would make his rounds at 4 p.m. every single day. Built like a bodybuilder and tough as nails, he was well respected in our small community. Hence, why we believed him when he told us about the witches and warlocks of our village. There was a woman's spirit that could make her rounds with the woods around our property, and Grandpa would always see her. I remember one day when I was sleeping alone in the master bedroom, and in my dreamy state, I saw a woman wearing sleep robes, and I honestly have to say that she was beautiful. I was so much in awe that my jaw must have dropped when I saw her from behind. I couldn't see her face as her hair was blocking it, but that's what I assumed. I know, silly me for wishful thinking. Don't judge me, as I was still relatively young at the time, so blame it on the raging hormones. I couldn't move my body. I was frozen. Call it sleep paralysis, but I remember vividly when the figure moved slowly across my bed. It moved in such a lustful way that I thought I was going to get raped by this demon. Then suddenly, it was on top of me and its face was just blank, like a blank canvas. It has no nose, no mouth, no eyes, but I could tell it was looking straight into my soul. I struggled to move, but I couldn't get myself free of the spirit that was pinning me down. I tried to pray to our father, but kept messing up the words in my head. Then the worst happened. It started to choke me. I felt a grip on my throat blocking my airways. I honestly thought that I was going to die that night. But I kept trying to move and get free from its grip. Tried praying harder, but in the end, I passed out from her choking. Miraculously, I woke up the next day thinking I was dead, but thank God, I survived. And from that day onwards, I'll always sleep with the lights on. The area where I live is somewhat of a rural part of the island. It's on a hill and the roads are creepy at night where you have to pass through lots of banana trees and bushes to get to our house. So the setting at night can give someone who's not brave the shivers if you're not used to the kind of place where no one hears you if you scream, as the next neighbours are not close by. When I was about 10 years old, I used to see a bonfire at the front yard and people around it chanting and dancing like in the movies. And that was all I thought of it, me imagining them in my head. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. 
I could really see spirits when I was younger. And now thinking back, I know that I had actually seen these chantings like it was some kind of ritual. And that brings us to this story. The local folk here know that there was a shaman living within the village among the many residents here. But what many of them didn't know was that this shaman performed abortions and was dwelling in the dark arts of black magic. So one day, when me and my buddies were cycling around the village, we happened to stop in front of the alleged shaman house. We got the hint because of the way the house was built. A rotten wooden house with a lot of bamboo growing around the whole house. It was creepy, and so us being nosy teenagers decided to check the place out. We parked our bikes outside the property and started to walk up to the front porch. There were dolls hanging inside the house, small ones that looked like they were hand sewn. The place was bare except for rubbish scattered around, and the only way I can explain the atmosphere was that it felt heavy. Like the oxygen was being drained from us from something that we couldn't see. The whole house had a very weird musty smell, and it was sickening knowing that it was once used to murder innocent babies. It was sad to imagine the life that could have been lived, but instead taken from them by their own parents, as it's still very much against the law to abort a child in my country. So most young girls who got pregnant by accident wanted nothing to do with having a child outside of marriage, so they came to these kinds of places as a solution. Hence why it's so dangerous for these girls to go through such a thing with an untrained shaman. Some of these did not go well for the mothers as well. So there were definitely angry and unclean spirits still roaming in that house. And the longer we stayed there, the more we felt sick to our stomachs. So we decided to move along and go home. It was when we were on our bikes that we heard something coming from inside the house. At first it was faint, but it grew louder and louder. It was laughter. The kind where you could hear the evil in their voice. Then we saw smoke started coming out of the roof. And before we could see anything else, we booked it out of there and went straight home. And since then, we never went anywhere near that house ever again. I used to sleep with my window wide open to let in the cold air, as the island that I reside in is quite hot and humid. So with the safety grill and also mosquito nets, it was very soothing to let the fresh air into the room at nights when I sleep. It was the whole night experience of insects and the occasional wind noise that was also soothing. I also loved to leave the windows wide open so I could see the light of the moon and like I said, the night experience. However, one night changed it all when I was about to sleep and still looking out the wide open window, I felt a cold breeze pass through and all of a sudden I could hear manic laughing. At first I thought I was dreaming, but I knew at that moment that I've not fallen asleep and was very much awake. Then, as if on cue, I saw what looked like a woman's figure flying past. Then I closed and opened my eyes again to make sure and there it was, a woman flying past my open window. The woman was on a broomstick and had a nose like a bird's, like the ones you see in cartoons and movies with witches in them. You heard me right. I saw a living witch and the only way I can describe her laugh was maniacal. I froze in my bed and didn't know what to do at the moment. I perched up to see if the woman would pass again, but the laughing disappeared and all went silent. I got up and closed all the windows and blinds and never opened the windows at night again to avoid seeing that again. I believe that these were witches roaming around my village as it was a full moon at the time. This part of the island has always had a creepy vibe to it. I was told by my late grandmother that these parts of our land were once used as a spot where during World War II, the Japanese used to massacre their captives by chopping off their heads and making a dumping ground around our property. Coupled with thick jungle, you can imagine the aura that we are living in, which is dark and unnerving. Yet we managed to live here until now. I remember one time that our gate was pushed as it was not fully installed in place while my mother was pregnant with my younger sister. I saw the whole incident in front of me and I was only about eight or nine years old at the time, but I remember vividly how it happened. The gate only started to fall when my mother turned her back to it 
and it looked like it was deliberately pushed and my mother fell to her knees while the heavy gate was on top of her. It all happened in a matter of seconds and all I could remember was that my father and cousins screaming and running towards my mother to lift up the gate. It took three of them to lift the gate and fortunately my sister didn't sustain any injuries as she came out a healthy kid. My father was a big skeptic regarding the paranormal and always told us that it was all coincidence and that we imagined it all as he never saw or experienced it himself. Until one day when he was sleeping on his bed alone and felt someone kick him off the bed. Dazed and still in a sleepy state, he told us about the incident but still didn't believe it was paranormal. He just said that it was unexplainable and was never deterred from staying on this land. One time, I also saw a figure pass by our kitchen when I went to get some water. The figure was a black mass like a shadow on the wall, but I knew that the thing was looking straight at me and with eyes wide open, I just froze and stared at it. Then in a few seconds, which felt like hours, the figure just disappeared into the window, but I was already so spooked that I ran back to the hall where my whole family was watching television. I came in screaming, telling them what I had just witnessed and my mother, being a strong Christian, went into the kitchen. Armed with holy water, I started praying and sprinkling it all over the house. She also felt it and knew what the spirit was still roaming around the house and only left after intense prayer. I want to start off by saying that my mother is a devout Christian and she wasn't afraid of spirits or demons as she would call them. She used to hear chanting and talking but couldn't understand the language while she was praying at night as if these spirits were trying to stop her from praying and distract her as much as they could so she would stop. But my mother would never let these spirits deter her from praying and so she would pray even harder to fend them off. On one occasion, while she was praying, one of these spirits came to disturb her. She took holy water and sprinkled it upwards where the voices were coming from and immediately heard screams of pain as if they were splashed with hot boiling water. And my mother would describe this as spiritual warfare. Night after night, she would repeat this and never give up the fight. Kudos to you, mum. Although she had a solid faith, there were times when these spirits would torment my mother in different ways. For a few months she would be disturbed by a male spirit where it would come to her when she was about to sleep and would feel the hairy spirit sit on her chest to a point where my mother couldn't breathe. It was like dog fur, thick and had a foul smell. All my mother could do was pray harder and rebuke it until it would eventually leave but then come back the next night to torment her again. It got to the point where my mother would leave all the lights on while she slept and as she couldn't get much sleep and would be screaming to them to just leave her alone. This disturbed us deeply and I would run downstairs to see what was happening when I heard her screaming at something that we couldn't see. I believed her as when I would come downstairs the hairs on my arms would stand and I could feel the evil presence and sometimes smell something musty like wet dog smell around the house but see no animals around, and as quickly as it came, it would disappear. So it was during a really intense examination period when I was having trouble sleeping due to stress. At night, I'd lay awake in our pitch dark room, unable to make a single sound or movement because my sister was asleep on the bed beside me. We had a bathroom in our room and the door to it was a bit wonky. It raised unevenly off of the floor, so if the lights were left on in the bathroom, it appeared as a strip of light in our bedroom. One of these nights, I looked over to find that my sister had accidentally left the light on in the bathroom. I thought about going to switch it off, but that train of thought ceased when I saw movement. A black shadow, visible against the light, moving around in the bathroom. There was nothing inside that could make the shadow and it had never appeared before that moment. I watched as though in a trance as it moved. No discernible figure. It was like a massive darkness writhing in place. As I watched, I felt fear, but at the same time was overcome by an odd sense of calm. I went to sleep within minutes. 
The shadow continued to appear. As I left the bathroom light on on purpose, so I could discern more about the shadow. At one point I got brave. Since it was in the bathroom, I rationalised that it wouldn't come through the door if I got off the bed. Thinking this, I switched on the light in our room and opened the door to the bathroom. There was nothing. I figured out by now that looking at the shadow entity helped me sleep, so I'd fallen into a habit of switching on the bathroom light at night and watching it. One day, I forgot to leave the light on. I stared into the dark, hoping I could make out the shadow creature's entrancing, writhing movement, and to my delight I could. Except this time, I realised I'd been sorely mistaken. The placement of our bathroom door is such that it's the darkest part of the room. One would scarcely notice a grown man standing there, much less a shadow. I stared at the dancing shadow and trailed my eyes upward, as the realisation dawned on me that the creature had never been inside the bathroom. I only thought so because of the contrast of light against dark. It was tall, a pillar of shadow that reached the top of the doorway and a little higher. Where its head must have been, the writhing mass was a little larger, a thinner portion just below that could have been a neck. I was afraid of it then. I considered calling to my mother for help when a thought came into my head. It wasn't my own thought. It had a voice in a way that your own thoughts do not. Like reading dialogue from a book, I suppose. It was a voice that was ethereal, almost like it didn't even speak at all. After each word, I thought I'd imagine the voice and then the next word came. You're safe. I won't hurt you. Go to sleep now. It didn't sound like it was ordering me. As soon as the voice stopped talking, the usual calm I feel when looking at the entity became much stronger, but not in a forceful way. It was being surrounded by a warm breeze. I was sitting up in bed, trying to fight off the feeling, but the thing came close to me and surrounded me. It was like a barrier and a blanket. I slept then. I've never rested so well before, and for the first time in a long time, I didn't dream. After that night, I didn't see the shadow ever again. I told my mother about it leaving, just as I had told her about it at its arrival. I didn't tell her it spoke to me. No matter how much I try, I've never been able to sleep as peacefully as I had during those days. In August of 2019, my family and I went on a trip to Bath, England, as we had been before but hadn't had a chance to visit the Roman sites. Unfortunately, when we arrived, we found that the Airbnb we'd booked was absolutely filthy. We weren't willing to stay there and couldn't find anything else, so we had to call off the trip and head home. Still haven't seen the Roman sites. It was a really long trip and we had already been ready to settle down for the evening when we arrived at the holiday flat, so the journey back stretched well into the night. My sister was incredibly tired and wanted to stop the night at a hotel, so we pulled into a travel lodge. As soon as we pulled in, I was instantly reminded of various footage I had seen of people moments before they disappeared. I got the inexplicable and chilling feeling that had we stayed, the hotel CCTV would be the last thing anyone would see of us. I was absolutely freaking out, but everyone was super tired and fed up, and I didn't want to cause problems. Thankfully, there were some complications with check-in. Despite her being the one who wanted to stop for the night, my sister insisted we leave and push through to home. As soon as we left, the feeling began to dissipate, though I was very shaken. On the journey home, my mum mentioned that it was Travelodge Shropshire, where many years previously we had stayed on another failed weekend break, but had to abandon the trip and leave the hotel in the middle of the night to go home early, because it was absolutely infested with fleas from stray cats and stank of their pee. Could I have remembered this and had some sort of flashback to an unpleasant childhood experience? Maybe. Though whilst I do remember that failed trip, all travel lodges look identical and I couldn't see the building in the pitch darkness anyway. Last week, I told my sister about the ominous feeling I had and she said she had felt exactly the same way and that's why she insisted we move on. To this day, why we felt like that is a mystery. But I know, had we stayed that night, the unexplained mystery would be our disappearance.
The first one happened when I was really little. I'd say in 2004, maybe, 2003. I suck with dates. This was one of the first experiences that I had, and it's pretty fuzzy. All I remember is being at the top of a flight of stairs and jumping down the whole thing. Almost like I could float down. I looked back on this one, and I thought that maybe I'd fallen down the stairs and didn't remember. But in that case, I would have gotten a shit ton of scrapes and bruises because it was a big wooden staircase. Likely not related to the other experiences I had, but still. Weird. There was some weird shit in between these two, but I'd rather just get to the meat of it for now. Anyways, here's the biggest one that really bothers me. When I was in middle school, I was a rebellious little shitbag and decided to try running away from home, fall of 2014. I got up in the middle of the night and just decided to walk straight down the road. Not sure what my plan was there. Anyways, I ended up following the highway until I ended up around Thunderbolt, east of where I lived, and was stupidly proud of myself for not chickening out and that I'd stopped crying. Anywho, I wandered some more, hopped some fences and made my dumbass adrenaline high and ended up in these dense, trashy woods. I started thinking over shit and crying again. Then I heard what sounded like my mom calling out my name from up on the highway and instinctively ran away from it. Once again, I was a stupid shit-stained kid. I remember looking up on the highway and just seeing a person go limp and fall off the side and under the overpass in my direction, then start running towards me on all fours like some kind of creature. It was super dark and I couldn't make out any features at all and I wasn't interested in getting closer. I just ran like the damn wind until my legs were shaking and I sat down in, in the underbrush. I was resting for a bit and shaking and crying and all that. Then I heard my mom calling me again. It sounded like it was the exact same volume, like it was from the same distance away. It almost sounded like a mosquito buzzing super quietly in my ear. I passed out for the night and then found my way back home in the morning. It was in June of 1972 that my mom and dad told me that they were taking a couple of our thoroughbred resources to Durango, Colorado, where my father owned land, and where we typically boarded some of the animals during the summer. This trip was nothing unusual, as it occurred rather frequently. The only difference this time was that my mother was going with my dad instead of me. I guess dad figured that at 13, I was old enough and responsible enough to do the morning and evening chores, which consisted of feeding and watering the remaining horses, which numbered about eight, a few cows, six pigs, and a coop full of chickens. There were also a few wounds to be smeared with ointment. These choices were not exactly rocket science, but it did take a while. So I was glad when Lyle offered to come with me and help each evening. He got a kick out of it as he enjoyed that kind of thing. I, however, leaned more towards the arts, performing magic, singing, playing the piano, and even doing ventriloquism. In fact, I did it professionally by the time I was 12. I had no intention of staying at the house alone while my parents were gone to Colorado. I was very much afraid of the dark and especially of being alone. It would be years until I discovered why. I was going to spend the weekend with two of my best neighbor buddies, Lyle and Mark Harper. Lyle was a year older than I was and Mark was a year younger, so I fit right in the middle of the two. They lived just three houses to the west of my house. I can't really call it a house that I lived in. It was one of four duplexes that my dad owned. Two of them were built back in the early 1920s and the other two were newer as they were built by my dad a couple of years after we moved there in the late 1960s. The two old units, A and B, and the two un new units, C and D, were split down the middle by our long asphalt driveway. The only other building on the property was a very old and very large white stucco garage slash shop, which was located behind the units at the end of the driveway. Beyond that old shop, was where the corals and pastures were. With my parents in Colorado, I was in charge of keeping all the animals fed. Darkness was just around the corner, so I took Lyle and we headed to my place. As we entered my driveway, we started walking between the old units and the new units toward the big garage. What made this shop unique were the giant rolling stainless steel doors, one on the left and one on the right, that met in the middle. 
It created almost a mirror effect, but not quite shiny enough to be a mirror. I happened to be looking at the door, noticing how the streetlight on 8th Avenue created just enough light to make our stretched shadows lightly appear on big metal doors. I commented to Lyle that I wished I was that tall in real life. And that's when it happened. With both of us looking at our very light shadows bouncing to the rhythm of our steps, another shadow, only very dark, no, black, so black that it looked like a thick, inky, one-dimensional entity, ran clumsily across the shiny door from left to right. It was wearing what looked like a wide-brimmed fedora hat. It had a troll-like appearance, all hunched over, as though it didn't want to be seen. It scurried quickly in total silence, until it reached the right side of the doors, after which it completely disappeared. We both stopped, frozen in our tracks, trying to comprehend what we had just witnessed. Before either of us could say anything, the thick, dark shadow man trotted back the other direction, once again disappearing as it reached the other side of the doors. Both of our minds instantly realized that nothing solid had run between us, and the doors and that were only way a shadow could be that dark was, well, there was just no way a regular shadow could be that dark. Without uttering a word, we both turned in sync, as though the move was choreographed, and took off running back onto 8th Avenue. Neither of us stopped until we arrived back to the safety of Lyle's house. Once inside, we ran to his father, Lloyd, who was watching the news on television, and told him that we needed him. We related our experience, and he said that he was sure there was a logical explanation. I knew, though, that there wasn't. He walked back to my house with us, and we began to experiment, attempting to recreate a shadow that was as dark as what we had seen just ten minutes before. It just wasn't possible. Mr. Harper agreed to stay with us while I did my chores in the now dark back pasture area. It would be years later that I would learn about shadow figures and how they operate. Since then, I've been blessed, or cursed, with several paranormal experiences, from full body apparitions to simply feeling the presence of spirits. I'm not sure why me, but I'm grateful for these experiences. We moved into a house in Northamptonshire a few years ago and instantly felt something was odd with the house. That feeling when someone is watching you, cold drafts. My husband started feeling compelled to say things. For example, he'd tell me that what I'd done during the day with eerie detail. He'd tell me about the girl who talked to him, but in his head. Things started going missing or would be moved to random places. One day, he said, Gongoozler, out of the blue. I've never heard that word, nor has he. I just assumed it was another one of his made-up words, but it turns out it's a word meaning someone who enjoys watching canals. There are lots of canals in the area, and one in the village. When I asked why he said that word, he told me the girl had said it to him, and she loved the canal. The weirdest thing that happened, though, was one evening when both my husband and our daughter wanted a shower. They decided Hubby would go first, but as we sat in our bedroom, we heard the bathroom door close, the light go on and the shower start. So we assumed our daughter must have just beaten him to it. The shower ran for 45 minutes and just as we were going to check if she was okay, we heard the shower stop and she came out of the bathroom and went downstairs. The light was left on. My husband turned off the light and followed her downstairs and watched her go into her bedroom, which was downstairs. As he walked into the kitchen though, our daughter walked in the back door. When he asked how she'd gotten dressed and out so quickly, she told him she'd been out for the last hour seeing her horses. So who was in the shower? He saw a girl again a few weeks later and also stood in our daughter's wall doorway. Lots of other strange things happened there, but never anything scary, just freaky. Anyway, we moved a couple of years ago and nothing has happened since. Until this weekend. We went away to a hotel in Cornwall. On the first night, it was very foggy and cold. As we stood outside having a cig, he suddenly said, Joan, Joan is waiting in the summer house. I asked what on earth he was talking about. 
He had a strange look on his face and just said, Joan is waiting in the summer house for Derek. Then he sort of snapped out of it, mouth hanging open, and said, I've no idea where that came from. We talked about it, and he said he felt compelled to say those things. He also felt she was military. We carried on discussing for, for a while, then mid-sentence he said, he's married and she's waiting in the summer house. A bit spooked, we decided to go back to our room. We reached on the internet and found out that in 1946, a young woman who was serving in the Navy was stationed at the hotel. Her name was Joan. She was having an affair with a married officer. When they were found out, she was transferred to another site in Devon. On the night she was due to move, she was waiting for him in the summer house where he shot her twice in the head. Her name was, his name was William. We were totally freaked out. The man's name was wrong, but at that time, people used known my other names frequently. I.e. my granddad was John, but called Jack, and my grandma was Grace, but was known as Queenie. Perhaps he was really known as Derek. So four nights ago, I was sitting in my vanity taking off my makeup after work. My vanity sits directly in front of my window, so when I'm sitting at it, I can see out of it, and faces west. Anyway, I'm close to done and reach for my drink, which was just to my right on the vanity, and I heard three very loud knocks on my window. I jumped up and back and threw my can of soda in the process, and started looking all around my backyard through the window, thinking someone was out there. The light was on in the back and I could see everything within at least 8 feet of my window. So I decided to brush it off, told myself I was being silly and it was just the wind as there was a mild breeze. Granted, there was, is absolutely nothing near my window that could hit it, even with strong winds, but whatever. So I sat back down and started cleaning the spilled soda and finishing my makeup removal. Less than 5 minutes pass and again. Three very distinct knocks directly on my window, but slightly softer this time. Again I jumped up and looked all around out of my window, only to see absolutely nothing and no one. I said screw this, and went to shower as I had planned to. A few minutes into my shower, I heard what I thought was my husband walking down the hall. The house sits up about four feet off the ground on four by fours. I think they're four by fours anyway. So any time we walk around, it's very audible due to the space beneath the floor and the actual ground. So I yelled his name and poked my head out of the bathroom because I wanted to tell him about the knocks. Well, from my bathroom, I can see directly into our bedroom and he was there laying in bed soaring logs, loud enough that I could hear it over the shower running. Not an abnormal thing. I choked the walking noise I heard to the house settling and shut the bathroom door again, and before I could even turn away from the door, I heard footsteps running back and forth, up and down the hall from the living room, towards the end of the hall and back. This only went on for 30, maybe 45 seconds, but it terrified me. I cut my shower short and hopped in bed and fell asleep. Cut to last night, I'm in my den watching TV, and I hear three knocks outside that sounded exactly like the ones I've heard days prior. My window is only about five feet away from the window in the den. My house is kind of L-shaped, and I swear it sounded like someone was knocking on my window again. I have no idea what's going on, but if anyone has any sort of inputs, including rational explanations, please share. I'm kind of freaked out about all of this. Alright, so this could get long, and I apologise for that in advance. Last night, my girlfriend took me to an allegedly haunted house on the outskirts of our county. Her brother and his friends stu stumbled on it when they were in high school, and she's been there several times, but swears that nothing like what occurred last night has ever happened. We had to drive down a secluded highway for about 20 minutes, and then turn down a shoddy gravel road for a quarter mile or so, just to reach the place. There's a pull-off on the gravel road that leads up to a rusted wrought iron gate and a concrete sign that reads, Charlie E, former slave. I can't make out the last name. 
Girlfriend took a picture the time she went there before with her brother. Anyway, as soon as our headlights hit the gate, I just felt overwhelming dread and fear. I'd felt perfectly fine as we made our way up the gravel road, but as soon as the gate, sign and forested area around the abandoned house were lit up, I felt incredibly anxious. We sat and talked for a bit, never leaving the car. We talked about what Charlie must have suffered through and how we hoped he'd found happiness and peace in his freedom. We pondered what kind of man he was and how he would feel about events in the world today. It just seemed respectful, almost like visiting a grave or monument. I was mid-sentence when another overwhelming wave of dread came out of nowhere. My girlfriend must have felt it too, because she grabbed my arm and said, Okay, we can go now. I hesitated for a moment, and she squeezed and said, Okay, can you back up now? With a slightly panicked tone in her voice. I threw the car in reverse and headed back down the gravel road toward the highway. As soon as our tyres hit the pavement, I started to hear a deep buzzing noise all around us, and the hair on my body stood up straight. The buzzing finally faded into a... I don't even know. It was low and high at the same time, almost like a scream and a bellow combined. I could feel it reverberate in my chest, and the noise sounded as though it was coming from inside the car. It only lasted maybe 10 seconds total, and then warped into a twisted cackling sound. I'm not kidding, it sounded just like a stereotypical witch's cackle. I looked over at my girlfriend to ask if she just heard that, but the lack of colour and the look on her face told me all I needed to know. She said quietly for about a minute, and then shakily said, Did, did you hear that? What the fuck was that? I nodded my head and said I had no idea. We hauled ass all the way back to civilization and went to her friend that's a practicing witching's house to clean ourselves and the car with sage. Cleansing didn't make the heavy feeling of dread leave either of us, and I'm still pretty shaken up about it today. I can't find any information about the house, Charlie, or even the road where it's located on Google. I can't get satellite images of the area, but there's no street view. I can't find any information through the county property appraisers' websites about who owns the land. I feel like what happened was a clear message that we aren't welcome and to stay away. The intense feelings of dread that are still with me totally reaffirm that. So, first and foremost, how do I protect myself and my girlfriend from anything that may have attached to us or followed us home? Secondly, I'm going back, alone and during the daytime. I need to know what's there and what happened here. How do I protect myself in that situation? I can't exactly blast a malevolent spirit with buckshot. I was about seven years old. It was summer and we were in the usual place that we had always frequented from July to August. That day, I remember that I had to learn to use the bicycle, and so I asked my mother if I could go to the yard to try. My mother gave me the okay, and so I went. Just outside the building, I met a little older child, 10 to 11 years old, and he asked me if I lived there, etc. In short, we didn't know each other, and he told me that he was the son of the two gentlemen who had rented the house next to ours, with the street number number three. I immediately understood who he was referring to, and we made friends. I told him that I had to learn to pedal the bike and I had to practice. He replied that he could help me. Being older, he already knew how to carry it. We spent the whole afternoon pedaling the bike down a slope and then climbing it. But being an experienced when I happened to make the descent, I couldn't break in time and I tumbled. The boy was laughing and so was I to tell the truth because in the end I wasn't hurt. Anyway, the afternoon ended and both the boy and I had to go and said goodbye. I went home and told that I had met this child and my mother understood who I was referring to because the day before she had talked to the gentleman who had rented that house and she knew they had a son. The next day came. I woke up happy, knowing that I could spend another day having fun with my new friend. So I went down and knocked on the couple in villa number three. As soon as they opened, I asked them if their son was in the house. They looked at me with a very strange air and said they answered me saying, maybe I had the wrong door. 
they didn't have a son. So, thinking that I had misunderstood, I asked them if they had a nephew who had come to play yesterday. They said no, and so I greeted them. You can't imagine my face at that moment. I wondered for who knows how long, who did I play with yesterday? But the thing that troubled me is that my mother knew him. She confirmed me all the day before. So I went back home and told my mother about the situation. I still remember her answer. She told me that yesterday I had not gone down. I'd stayed at home playing with toys until evening. I told her about the boy in villa number three, but she didn't. She didn't understand what I was talking about since they had no children. At this point, I was convinced it was a joke. I insisted so much that she got angry. I remember that I looked at my arms and legs to look for bruises due to the bike and there was nothing. Also because I actually didn't hurt myself by falling. People, I swear to you, I still don't know what happened. I can't explain why the day before my mother knew about this family and the day after she didn't. I also checked in the following days, but nothing. I never saw that kid again. After 30 years, I still can't explain this story to myself. A hypnagogic dream? It may be, but I'm sure it was all true. I remember that moment very well, moment by moment. Colours, noises, smells, all. That child was from another house, and then after the holidays, he went away. Okay, but why didn't my mother remember it anymore? Who were you referring to when you told me that about the family in Villa Number 3? A journey into another dimension? A very fervent fantasy, a ghost, a misunderstanding, an extremely realistic dream. I don't know how to explain it. And I think that from that event, I started to be more mentally open to these stories and to those who tell them. I was walking with two friends to take one home after school. We had to walk up a dodgy country road and it was away from the surrounding towns. It was still daylight outside, being around four o'clock, and there were tall bushes either side of the road. We got about halfway up onto a straight bit, and I saw on the other side, standing inside the bushes, two really tall, slim, black silhouettes. They didn't look like real people, but had the body of one and about seven foot tall. I had stopped and said to the other two, what the fuck was that? And they turn around and say, what? But I said it was nothing, as I just thought I was seeing things. A couple of minutes after this, my friend stopped and said the same thing. You could hear she was spooked. She explained to us that she saw the exact same thing. We all started freaking out. We end up dropping my friend off and having to walk back the way we came. With me and my friend reached the bottom of the road, not far from where I saw them, we both got hit by a pretty bad car. She got lucky and knocked by the headlight and fell to the side, whereas I got hit and went over the bonnet and the roof and slid down the side, getting stuck on the wing mirror and dragged around the corner. The car was going around 50 miles an hour when it hit us. I believe I should have died, but instead I came out with only one broken leg. I obviously had big grazers, but only one broke single bone. None of these injuries have stayed with me, I've got no scars or anything. I think about this all the time and how it's all such a coincidence. How there were two of them and two of us got hit by the car on the same road, only about 40-ish minutes later. I'd love to know what people have to think about this, because I think about this a lot. I was about 14 years old and at a church for a Christmas program. During the program, I noticed someone seated nearby that just had something unusual about them, some kind of special energy. I noticed this person watching me several times. I thought it was a little odd, but I wasn't worried about it. He had a kind face that radiated interest or concern, and was dressed in a light blue satin baseball jacket, jeans, and solid white Nike tennis shoes. After the program was over, I was in another part of the church with family and friends. While we were talking, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the man again. He was at the other end of the room, leaning against the corner that led to a hallway. He was watching me intently, simply staring without looking away at all. By this time, I was thinking he must be an angel, perhaps my own guardian angel. Whoever he was, I wanted answers. 
I pretended to keep talking to people and took two steps backward away from the group. When I was good and clear, I took off running straight toward the man as fast as I could. When he saw this, he jumped away from the counter, turned into the hallway and ran as fast as he could. I was only a few yards behind him. The hallway was a blank wall on the left side and on the right side were three doors. He went into the middle one. All right, I thought to myself, door number two it is. I caught up within seconds and stepped into the doorway. Just as I spotted him in the room, I saw him throw what looked like a whole ream of copy paper directly at me like a frisbee. The paper came flying right at my face, so I turned my head quickly and covered my face with my arms. A second or two later, when I realised the paper hadn't hit me, I lowered my arms to see a completely empty Sunday school room, with sheets of paper going everywhere, drifting toward the floor like giant snowflakes. The man wasn't there. He had vanished. There was only one door into the room, and I was standing in it. He hadn't pushed past me to get out. The only windows were little rectangle ones up high that didn't open, and I don't think a person could have fit through one anyway. I called out after him. That's not fair. I walked away fairly certain my first instinct was correct. I also wondered if all angels wore white nikes. I didn't pick up the paper either. I was just too stunned. This happened to me last night and I don't know how to explain it. For a bit of context, my father recently became ill, so I've moved home to help out my mother for a while. I still have young siblings and a grandparent living in the house, so I decided to stay in my parents' caravan out back. They only use it in the summer, so I thought I could get some privacy. The caravan gets cold at night, so my dad gave me an electric heater to warm it up, but my mother is very worried, and is worried that leaving it on overnight could start a fire. I promise this is relevant. So last night I went to sleep, and at around 4am I heard banging on my window. I jumped up and opened the curtain, and my mother was standing there. Not gonna lie, I was a little worried something happened to my father. But she was just there to tell me to turn the heater off. I say, great, thanks for waking me up for that, then try to get some sleep. This is where the weirdness begins. Just as I turn over, I hear very faint crying. At first I thought it was someone in the house, but it was coming from the direction of the shed behind the caravan. I think to myself it's just some fox or other animal, but it slowly starts getting louder. Not extremely loud, but loud enough that it was keeping me up. I fling the curtains open to scare whatever animal was out there, but it was no animal. A child-sized shadow thing was sitting against the shed, its head and its knees crying. I've never jumped up so fast in my life. I instantly turned on all the lights and ran back to the window, but it was gone, and the crying had stopped. I quickly jotted down all the features of it so I wouldn't forget, and I stayed up with the lights on all night. I'm scared it'll come back. Does anybody have any info on what this could be? It was child-sized, and it was like a shadow. The only features I could see were its body shape. Never been so scared in my life. I've just had a baby. Well, just being two months ago. I'm having no sleep, I'm cranky, and those who know this stage know how difficult it is. Regardless, weird things have been going on in our house ever since bringing the baby home from the hospital. It first started with strange smells. I know what you're thinking, nappies and such, but I assure you it wasn't those or my daughter. I'd be feeding her and putting her in the crib next to me and go get a bottle of water out of the fridge. Upon entering the kitchen, which is down the stairs and a few more rooms away, it smelt like rotting garbage. That's the best I can describe it. I thought the kitchen sink was blocked up again and made a mental note to mention it to my husband in the morning. I mentioned it and he took it apart and nothing. No blockage and no smell. It seems the smell moves from room to room. Next, I'm awake mostly all night. I would hear three loud random knocks at our bedroom door. My husband and I would be in bed and no one else would be in the house. We only live with it being us three. Myself, my husband and our baby. I thought I was losing my mind or so sleep deprived 
that I was making it up. Or maybe something fell on time and my imagination hung on to that. I don't know. It happened every night. I'd open the door and see no one there. No windows open. Nothing. Like I said, I thought I was going crazy. Until my husband stayed up with her one night while I got some rest. I hastily got into bed and willed myself off to sleep in case he changed his mind. And the next thing, I'm getting shaken awake. It's my husband asking if I heard the knocks. Okay, just not me. I told her not to worry and went back to sleep. No one was going to ruin my very rare nap time. I now keep having dreams of this figure. It's a shadow man, but I can make out some features. It seems to have four sets of horns on its head and is pitch black. Sort of like a black swirl, if that makes sense. In my first dream, it was standing in the door hallway, blocking me from exiting. It was blacker than the room and had red eyes. I started to feel an overwhelming sense of dread and then my daughter cried. I woke up from that dream. The next one, it's right over my daughter's crib and staring down at us. I told my husband about this as in a look how crazy I am with no sleep sort of way and he went white. He grabbed me and the baby and the next thing was sitting in the car. He said he didn't want it to hear us. He told me that he was trying to nap on lunchtime as I was out with our baby shopping and he thought, why not? He awoke to this black, swirly thing right next to him, its face inches away from his. He said it didn't have a face, just had f four black shadow horn outlines and a wispy black body. Its head was on the same pillow as my husband's, that's how close they were. He told me he jumped backwards as in a sort of, oh crap moment. And when he did the figure, folded in on itself and left. Not without that god-awful smell. Help, please, guys. What is this? What do we do? I want my daughter to be safe. Most of my mornings start at 3.30am. I pull myself out of bed and stumble around until I get to work at 4am. Typically, there are two of us to open. A baker who makes all of my donuts, and me, the opening manager, who makes all the coffees. This particular morning, I was late. 15 minutes late, but enough to scare my baker into thinking I'd just let him to his own devices until 7am, when the rest of the employees came in. As the general manager, I see and hear everything that goes down in my store. I had heard the spooky stories about Tim knocking over cups and causing a ruckus. To me, Tim was an imaginary person that everyone liked to joke about. Even I did, saying that, oh no, this spill is on the counter. Must have been Tim. Shame on him. We laughed and joked about him and blamed him for all our problems. It kept spirits light and gave us a scapegoat when something went wrong. Tim, however was a fake ghost. I was sure, just a running joke. Was fake. I walked in at 4.15am to find my baker standing in the front line and not in the back where his station was. Eyes wide and a scared expression. I immediately got worried. I asked him what was wrong and he just said, there's someone else here. So here we are, a small coffee shop located right in front of a city jail. Attempted break-ins were a regular thing with the colder weather. Inmates were released and their ride never showed. Just looking for a warm place to spend the night. My baker rattled off how he had heard the cooler door open and shut. Then someone shuffling across the beverage station. He went around the corner, thinking I had come in while he was in the freezer. He then heard running down the back hall and our swinging door being slammed open and the person go out into the dining room where I was currently standing. Our security system sends alarms out when the doors are opened without the code. My baker said he hadn't heard the alarm. A manhunt ensued. I searched every single place a person could be. We looked for signs of a break-in, signs of a robbery, something. I took him to the office. We locked the doors behind us and checked the cameras. 4.12am. 
my cooler door opened. A couple seconds later, and the swinging door, just like my baker had said. He sits in the parking lot for me now, and waits until I get there. We've been keeping it to ourselves. So, my sister contacted me today, informing me that our mom was freaking out due to sound captured while my mom was sleeping in the middle of the night. Keep in mind, my mom is recently divorced and has just recently become an empty nester about five months ago. Backstory, my sister had noticed about a month ago that my mom was gasping for air while she was taking a nap. Sis, being a nurse, suggests she speak with a doctor about potentially having sleep apnea. Mom, being as stubborn as she is, instead downloaded an app from the app store to record sounds while she was sleeping. My mom started to record herself about two weeks ago. Over those past two weeks, she would review the sounds the following morning. She did hear some knocking sounds, but assumed it was either her hand hitting the top of the bed, or just random house creaking noises. The home my mom lives in is a new build, roughly two years old, and was built on what we believe was just normal farmland. Her dog, a 12 year old Maltese, over the last two to three months, would wake up barking at two to three a.m. But my mom thought someone in the neighborhood was getting up for work and spooking him. So she moved him to sleep in another room so she wouldn't be woken up. Also over that time, as I just found out today, my mom had also complained about scratches on her back that were in places she couldn't reach. She showed this to my sister, grandfather and grandmother. They thought maybe the dog was scratching her, but she believed she would have felt and remembered that. To her knowledge, this has happened around four times. Well, this morning, my mom got up, checked the recordings, and heard audio. My sister said she called her in a fuss, freaking out about the audio she captured overnight. My sister went over, heard the video, and having no explanation, decided to forward it along to me. I was skeptical and laughing as I got the video, thinking this was just another instance of my mom and sister being irrational. As soon as I heard the video, the hair on my neck and arm stood up. This is mainly due to the fact that it clearly sounds like someone else is in that room with her. The creepy piece is that you can clearly hear my mom moan in pain and start to roll over in bed before the voice speaks. On top of that, the voice sounds very confident and in my opinion, ominous. The words don't sound like any words I know. I speak German and English and neither my mom nor my mother have any sort of technical background to make this sort of prank and send it to me. Also, they forwarded it using the app's forwarding mechanism via email, so I knew without a doubt that this was coming straight from the app. I asked the following questions and received the following answers. Does mom sleep with a fan on? No, she hasn't slept with a fan for two to three years. Was the TV on when she fell asleep? She doesn't have a TV in her bedroom. Again, new house, I don't visit much. What kind of pillow or mattress does she have? Could it have made a sound of air being let out when she turned over? She has a memory foam pillow or mattress. My sister jumped on the bed and rolled over with it with no hissing air sounds coming from any place. After exhausting all rational ideas, I started Googling and searching for paranormal things that could have caused this. We did find that my mom has a mirror on the dresser and had another makeup mirror on the same dresser. They were facing each other, but I have to be honest and say that I'm not sold on the paranormal idea of being gateways when that happens. I'm not going to say what I think the voice is saying, as I don't want to impact anyone's opinion. We did find a couple meanings in different languages, but I'd really like native speakers of those languages to identify and tell me what they believe it's saying. After finally running out of paranormal ideas, I decided to be like every other human being and turn to the internet for help. Please, please, please tell me there's a valid explanation for this, so we can put the issue to rest. My mom is saying she's 100% set on selling a place, which may not be a bad idea given she's an empty nester and that house is too big anyway, but that's a lot of effort for a hopefully easy explanation. I have a story and question about the paranormal that hopefully maybe someone here can finally answer. 
Has anyone ever had an experience like this? Or th something similar, perhaps? My best friend and I were outside having a late night conversation. We live in a very small town on the edge of the forest, in the middle of the Great Canadian Shield, a very large forest that covers central Canada. It was about 2 a.m. when we suddenly heard a howl that picked up a few other calls. Nothing strange yet, but it picked up more and more howls, until the point it sounded like there were hundreds of thousands of wolves. Initially, my friend and I tried yelling over the sound, but even though we were right next to each other, we couldn't hear one another. It got so loud at the end we couldn't even think to ourselves, it was mind-numbing. Then as suddenly as it started, the howls died out. Quickly, from hundreds of thousands, to four or five, then to one or two, and then silence. Not one howl for the rest of the night. The thing is, we have absolutely no mountains. It's flat forest land. Not only that, we have wolves in the area, though not that many for sure. But no one else in the neighborhood heard the sounds when we asked around. My best friend's mother lives closer to the sound and is a light sleeper who had her window open. She heard nothing. Neither did my grandmother, whose house we were standing in front of. Nothing. We had no idea what to make of this event. Finally, after about six months, I realized something bone chilling. No one heard us either. What happened to us or our voices? Did we have a shared hallucination? If so, why did no one still hear us screaming to each other then? It's never happened again. Has anyone else out there, anywhere, ever had an experience like this or something similar? Or maybe has a theory on what happened on what might have made this noise? This is a true story that happened when I was 16. I'm 23 now and still have no idea what could have happened. So this is a story from back when I lived in Derrida, Louisiana. I was around 12 when this was happening. So apparently the house we lived in was beforehand occupied by an older gentleman and his family. Never really knew much about it, but I heard a rumor from neighbors around saying that an older man died in the house we were living in. It was a beautiful big house, four bed, two bath, and a huge living room and dining room. It also had an office room that we later used to turn into a bedroom. But the way the neighborhood set up was a big square only one way into the neighborhood. And our house was on one of the corners of the big square. We didn't have any street lights around our house and it was kind of sloped down into a ditch. So when it rained hard, it would usually flood the whole backyard and everything around it. The rest of the neighborhood was more elevated and had street lights. Our house was the only house that had no lights around it. It was honestly creepy at night when we were pulling into our driveway. But anyways, ever since we moved into that house, I always had this weird feeling, like someone or something was watching me. It never really did too much damage because I thought that maybe it was just me being young and scared, but boy, was I wrong. Many weird things happened in that house that were unexplainable, but one of the first things that started happening was I would see a dark shadow looking figure run past our garage door. We would usually leave the left garage door open and the right closed. And when the left was open, you could see right through our door that leads into the garage because it had a glass window. But I would randomly see this figure run past really fast. And I thought maybe it was just my eyes because I would catch it in the corner of my eye. But slowly and surely, all of my siblings started to see it. We never really mentioned it because it never really bothered any of us like that, I guess. But then it started to get more frequent and it made me curious and wonder if it was really a ghost or spirit. So I decided to ask my brothers if they've seen it, and they said yeah, that they thought they've seen something run past a few times. And as we were talking in the kitchen, my mom and stepdad at the time come out of their room and hear us talking about it. And they too said that they've also seen the figure as well. And at that moment, that we were all standing by the garage door, we all saw it run past. My stepdad swung open the door and ran out. Everyone followed right after him, and it took no more than two or three seconds to get outside. Our backyard was massive, and there was absolutely nowhere that a person would have run and hide from us without us seeing them. There was woods at the end of our backyard, but it was at least a hundred meters or more. 
we were all standing outside looking like we're crazy people. And from there on out, we knew it had to have been something paranormal. A little after that, weird things started to happen and it got a little more interesting. Nothing that was absolutely crazy enough to drive us off and run away from the house, but creepy enough to look back on it and say to myself that I've definitely seen some ghostly stuff. So I live in Anchorage, Alaska. And if you know about Alaska or anyone in Alaska, there are nine out of 10 chances that they're gonna love fishing. That's what Alaska is all about in the summer. But anyways, I was chilling at home with my brother and out of nowhere, he decided to take a drive out to Kenai and do an overnight fishing trip. It was around 10.30 PM. I had nothing to do considering that it was summer and had no school. So I decided I'd go with him. We packed all of our stuff into his truck and by the time we were heading out, it was 11.30ish. It was dark and windy that night, but we said fuck it and kept going anyways. We were about an hour out from the spot we were gonna fish at, and all of a sudden, it started to rain super hard. I mean like crazy hard. The wind was blowing hard as well. I could feel the truck swaying a little every now and then when a big gust of wind would hit the truck. And if you're from Alaska or know about it a little, you'd know that driving from Anchorage to Kenai in that kind of weather ain't fun. And there are also not many places on the way. There are spots where it's nothing but woods for miles, no houses or anything for a while. And out of nowhere, I had this sudden urge to want to put my head down and ask to myself or whoever I was asking if there's proof of higher beings or anything out of this world out there. Show me yourself. Show me proof of you. And I slowly opened my eyes and tilted my head up. And as soon as I looked up, my heart sank. Off in the distance of my brother's headlights, I seen this bright white. And as soon as we got closer to it, I noticed it was a person walking on the side of the road. And I mean like this was white, like the brightest white that I've ever seen. Nothing but white. No colored shoes, nothing just pure bright white. I had chills shoot straight through my body, looked over at my brother and asked him if he saw that. He nodded and said, yeah. He was confused on why I was tripping out and looking back. And after I told him that I had said to myself, he started tripping out. And to remind you, there was no house or anything around for miles. It was also raining super hard and windy as fuck too. Occasionally I think about it and it makes me trip. I don't know what to really think about it other than a higher being or something of that cause. Just really weird. But when I put my head down and asked for something to show itself, it did. So this is a quick story from back when I lived on Cherry Street, Muldoon, Alaska. My mom rented out a duplex when I was younger we lived there for a few years. Weird things did happen in that house, but it never really phased me all too much besides one time, but that's a different story. But I remember my mom had this gray camera. It was kind of like an old school one. We've taken a few pics on it and then after a while, we just need to throw it into the bin that we had that was full of electrical stuff. But one day I was going through the box looking for a Wii controller and I remember the camera catching my eye. For some reason I felt like I had to charge it up and turn it on, and so I did. Everything was normal, until I went into the camera roll, and this is where things just went south. I started going through the pictures and saw three pics that were in black and white grey. I'm not sure if that camera takes black and white pics, or the pics that we've taken beforehand were all colour. But when I looked at the first black and grey pic, I was weirded out. There was this girl who seemed to be 12 or 13 years old taking a selfie on the camera. But the weird thing wasn't just me not knowing who that person was. It was also taken in our hallway, right next to my bedroom door bookshelf. And the bookshelf that we had was filled with books and random stuff. But in the picture that was on the camera of the girl and the bookshelf, it was empty. And the only things that were on the bookshelf were skulls. But they didn't look like actual skulls. They were like see-through, smoky-looking skulls. Kind of like a cloud, 
but in a perfect skull form. There were about three skulls, and the other two pictures that were taken on the camera were just pictures of the bookshelf itself and the skulls on them. To this day, we have no freaking idea who or how that was possible. It's honestly really freaky and weird. It wasn't a previously used camera because my mom bought it brand new. And even if it was previously owned, how would that person or whatever she was have taken the pic in our house? I wish we would have kept the camera, but my grandmother that was living with us at the time was a super Jehovah witness. So she made us throw it away. No one in the house knew who she was. Some creepy stuff. So this story might be pretty short. Everything happened relatively fast. So this was back when I lived on Cherry Street, Muldoon in Anchorage. My dad came up to visit us from Hawaii after he got out of jail. My mom was at work and he was there watching us. It was a pretty chill day. We were gonna to go to the zoo, so my dad decided that he would do my little sister's hair. They were sitting down in the recliner that was facing down the hallway. Halfway through doing my sister's hair, he asked my older brother to go grab a comb for her hair. And me being the nosy slash ADHD filled child I was, I got up and followed right behind my brother to go into my mom's room to grab the comb. As soon as we opened the door, we were greeted with an absolute cold breeze and the sight of a teenage looking girl on the far side of mom's bed. The bed wasn't against the wall, it was in the middle of the room, so there was enough room on both sides of the bed to have walking space. Me and my brother both froze instantly and looked down the hallway at my dad and little sister. At first we thought it was my sister for some reason, but no, nope, she was still there sitting down getting her hair done. And when me and my brother looked back, the girl was standing right in front of us. I'm talking like some horror movie stuff, like literally The Grudge. It was hella scary. At the time I was like seven or eight. But right after that, me and my brother looked booked it down the hallway and I yelled out, oh my God, there's a ghost in the room. And my sister out of nowhere just threw the brush that she was holding down the hallway and it hit the fish tank at the end and broke it. Water was everywhere in the hall and it was carpet. She said she threw the brush because when she looked up after we ran past, she said she saw the girl running after us. It was just so crazy. Like I literally mean it when I say that it was like the grudge straight out of the movie. It was hella scary. That's probably one of the most serious encounters that I've ever had. I've had plenty more, but this one just about tops them all. I just finished watching the interview with Joe Rogan and David Fravor about his UFO sighting. Well, I decided I wanted to share an experience me and my brother had several years ago. I've told all of my family and friends, but I've never shared it online other than on my personal Facebook when it happened. My grandpa and two uncles used to work at NASA in various positions. My uncles both denied ever hearing about anything extraterrestrial while working there, whereas my grandpa wouldn't tell me any specific stories, but he told me he knew we weren't alone. Anyway, I grew up in Cape Canaveral, Florida, but I now live in Georgia, about 20 minutes south of Atlanta, which is where this took place. So several years ago, in the summer, me and my brother rode in his truck to the gas station to get snacks and cigarettes. After we got our things, we decided to park in a space facing the road so we could smoke before we went home. My mom didn't know we smoked at this time. We were sitting there, and I remember distinctly that we were drinking Yoohoo's and eating hot Cheetos. Everything about this experience stayed in my mind. And whenever I visit that gas station or drink a Yoohoo now, I think about it and what we saw. So we were sitting there just talking and I noticed something in the sky and I said, what's that? My brother looked and we saw five lights in the sky in a V formation. They weren't moving, but just sitting there. We do live close to Hartsfield Jackson Airport and we see planes all the time. These were not planes. It was in the middle of the daytime and the lights were bright. And like I said, not moving. Well, as we were staring at the lights, the two top lights at the top of the V flew in different directions extremely fast. 
and then came back and joined the formation. This happened in about a second. Here's the best way I can describe the way the lights went. After that, the middle two lights did the same thing, flew quickly away and then back into the formation. Next, all of the lights scattered in different directions and didn't return. They disappeared. We were shocked by what we just saw and drove home quickly to tell our mom. I then posted on Facebook asking anyone if they saw the lights in the sky and two other people who lived near me said they did. Some people asked why I didn't take a picture or video. Well, first of all, when it happened, we were both so enamored by what we were seeing, it didn't occur to me to pull out my phone. It all happened so fast, maybe in the span of about 45 seconds. And we were so focused on what we were seeing, it just didn't cross either of our minds. Second of all, at this time, my brother had an iPhone he left at home, but I only had a slide phone, so the camera wouldn't have been that good. Anyway, I think about the occurrence all the time. My brother is a no-nonsense type person. He's a non-believer of everything from ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot, etc. I don't know really how to describe him, but definitely not someone who would make up a UFO story. He might not even tell anyone just to keep himself from looking weird to others, but even he can't explain what we saw and will corroborate the story. Me, I'm very open-minded. Since this happened, I definitely believe in extraterrestrials and have become interested in other mysteries like cryptozoology and stuff like that. This happened on the White Earth Reservation. The particular town this happened on is built on top of an old burial ground. I've always believed in the spiritual world. I've astral projected, but I always kept my mind closed off to the spirits. White Earth is known to have heavy spiritual activity and many hauntings. Here's my story. On this full moon lit night, I was with a group of five friends, including myself. It was around 2 a.m., we had got on the topic of ghosts and the oldest friend with us suggested going to look for spirits in some of the known haunting areas. We were hyped and didn't think much of what we were going to do. We grabbed a rifle and we all loaded up into the SUV. There's a trail called Tibet's Road on the outskirts of town. There's two houses, the first quarter mile, and that it goes very deep into the woods for many miles. During the ride through trail, we were calling out spirits and yelling out the windows talking shit to any spirits around. We arrived about halfway into two old time abandoned cabins on the edge of a swamp that were 15 feet from the truck. When me and the oldest friend, we'll call him T, hopped out by the first one, something went splashing into the water. We couldn't see anything. He walked over there and started shooting around his gun trying to humor us. The others didn't want to hop out and I was kind of spooked with the whole idea. We decided to leave, so we went a bit further by the second cabin to turn around. At this point, I felt safe and opened my mind completely up to the spirits. We stopped and looked towards the second cabin, which was further out. I had front seat next to T. He said, do you see that back behind the cabin? And I couldn't see anything. I focused my eyes, kept looking, and pretty soon this white figure appeared. I kept looking and it was some sort of white creature peeking its head around the corner with an alien type head and big empty eye sockets. It seemed like it was short or on all fours. It would peek at us, then go behind the cabin. It kept doing this for about a minute. In my head, I was spooked and couldn't believe what I was seeing. T was trying to hop out and go see the creature, but I was panicked and said, this is how people disappear. Finally convinced him not to go. As we started leaving the woods, this really small and long fox looking thing ran up beside the truck, ran in front of us, then cut into the woods. At this point, I started hearing chant-like music that was really soft, like women or children singing. And I had the feeling it was a death song. T didn't care, but I being sober and very intuitive started to pray out loud and try to block out the song, but I couldn't. We finally made it out and I was relieved. But that experience and the feeling of safety made us want to look some more. He knew of a spot in the middle of town that supposedly had a bad spirit there. The background of this spot is two uncles raped their eight-year-old niece, killed her, and took her to this short trail. 
that connects from an old powwow grounds to highway and is heavily wooded, then burned and left her body within the past 30 years. Apparently a strong evil spirit now lives where her body lives. This was T's past cousin, so he knew her name. We parked on the trail next to that spot and I began to call out her name and saying things like, come play with us. All of a sudden, mid-level along the tree line, I saw three black flashes, zigzag, and after the third flash, something snarled and hit the rear of the truck. We got the hell out of there. The young teen guy behind me saw the same flashes and we all heard the snarl slash attack. The teen girl started crying. This is where it gets wild and I feel like we were connected or opened a portal. At this point, the whole town was foggy, maybe like 250 population. We made it through the trail and came to a turn on the highway, which connects the trail. There's a big downhill open area that leads to a flattened swamp. And this is where a body was found about six years ago. We stopped and decided to take a look down there. Among the fog, I seen spirits for the first time. There was five spirits standing in a circle. They're whitish, smoky blue, human size, human shape, and have holes where the eyes should be. One of them noticed us. He would just turn and look at us. There was a few other spirits wandering around, and there were these black ones that were bigger than human, and once they noticed us, they would start, coming towards us in long, slow-paced, zigzag fashion. I felt like their intent was evil, and we decided to leave before they got any closer. We went to another swampy area, and I couldn't believe it. We saw more spirits and more of the black ones that would then start coming towards us. Around this time it was 5am and the sun was starting to rise. We went back over by where the little girl was killed, except we went on a trail opposite of the flatland swamp and the trail she died on. We had to walk, so we got out of the vehicle and felt safe, being it was lighter out. Coming directly from where the thing attacked our car, you could hear an adult girl crying and moaning out loud, and it gives me goosebumps to this day. I'm pretty sure it's the soul of the girl or something sinister trying to mimic her. The next night, I was at a different friend's in another town. He has a basement with no door in the living room, and his cat kept sitting at the top looking down, as if something was there. It did it a few times. Then at 3am that night, exactly around the time the phenomena started happening the night before, I seen a black shadow go along the wall towards the TV, and the cat was running after it. As soon as it got behind the TV, the TV cut out to static, and we had to reset it. For the next year, after all of this, whenever I would think of it, usually at night time, I would wake up the next morning with handprints on my wrist. This happened probably six times before I really put my mind to prayer and cleansing myself of whatever attached to me. Spirits are real, my friends. I know what we did was very disrespectful and obviously disturbed the peace. I've grown in spirituality, energy, and wisdom since then. So this happened to me when I was around six or seven years old, and I'm unsure if it was just a crazy dream or false memory or what, but here it goes. When I was younger, my grandparents and I took a trip to my great grandma's house for a family reunion style get together. We stayed for five days and the days were fun, but the nights were a different story altogether. I was said to sleep in a spare room on some rickety old bunk beds with my older, I think she was nine, cousin Laurie. She took the bottom bunk and I took the top because everybody knows the top bunk is cooler. Literally, the house had no air conditioning and it was closer to the ceiling fan. Laurie's mom was out of work and had been staying with my great grandma to get back on track and try and find a job. Across from the bunk beds, there was a big hole in the wall where I was told my great uncle Buck had fallen down trying to roller skate in the house and his elbow had gone through the wall. The first night I slept there, nothing happened. Or if it did, I was so sleepy from the long drive, I didn't notice it. But the second night, I got really freaked out. After Laurie and I got in our bunks and her mom turned the lights out, I didn't fall asleep for a while. And when I did, it felt like I woke back up immediately. The room was still dark and when I rolled over to try and look down at the clock on the opposite wall, my eyes were drawn to the hole. 
It took me a minute to realize what I was seeing because it was something lighter colored moving in the hole. You know how at night when it's really dark, you can kind of see light or white things. The hole had this really weird look of moving white in it. And I leaned and squinted trying to see what it was. Eventually I got still and I realized it was an eyeball. Imagine if you were to look into a dollhouse through a hole you made in the wall of it. It was like I was the doll inside and this big eyeball was looking through the hole. The white I saw moving was the white of the eye growing larger and smaller as the pupil looked around different parts of the room. Now the hole on the wall wasn't tiny. I'd say it was the size of an irregularly shaped dinner plate. So for the eye to take up so much of it, I couldn't even see the whole thing. It had to be huge. I was paralyzed with fear and pulled the covers up over my head and laid there sweating in total silence until I eventually fell asleep and morning came. If it had just happened once, I'd say it was just a bizarre dream. But every night I slept in that room, the eye came back. I'd fall asleep, then jolt awake later. And there it would be in the hole. And I'd be too scared to move. It's a miracle I didn't wet the bed because if I had to go, I'd have been too scared to move. I never mentioned it to my grandparents because I was convinced they'd think it was a bad dreams and take away my TV privileges. Isn't it messed up how as a kid you're more concerned with losing TV access than something that was scaring so bad at night you were paralyzed? I did however bring it up with Laurie on our last day there and I'll never ever forget what she said to me even though it's been 20 years. She looked at me in the face, no laughing and said, it's okay, he can't get through there, he's too big. To this day, I have no idea what she meant by that. Who's he? Did she see it too? I would have thought she was teasing me, but she said it in such a matter of fact way I didn't and still don't know how to take it. Years later, I asked her about it and she claims to not remember the incident at all. This has led me to speculate that maybe it was just a recurring dream I had as a child and me asking her was just a false memory, but I don't know. It's something that stuck with me in a way that some of the other childhood nightmares I had haven't. I lived in a haunted house when I was four or five years old. I can remember some things as far as back as about two and a half years old. Some of this, my memory, some of this are things my parents told me when I was a little older. It was probably 1978 and the house we lived in came with my dad's job since he was a milker. The house was really old. One time a guy came to work in our bathroom and he said the nails that we used to hold the house together were square and they didn't have a round head like nails today. His guess was the house was built before 1920. There were only two things that were unusual about the house. It was a huge two-story house. And sometimes when we would come home, there was a bell about 30 feet off the ground that was rusted solid and it would start ringing. The other thing that happened was at night when we would go to sleep. As long as we didn't have any house guests on the second floor, we would often hear a party going on on the second floor music and people talking and laughing. I do remember when we moved into our next place, I was looking for the ghosts there. I thought they came with every house. The second house I lived in that had a ghost was a house my parents bought when I was still in high school as a junior. Anyways, this ghost was nice. You could normally see her out of the corner of your eye in the living room. I know it wasn't just my imagination because my friends saw her too and we all gave the same description. Small elderly woman, about five feet tall, dressed all in black, and she would get hazy and disappear from about mid-thigh down. Sometimes when I would come home, if I'd had a particularly bad day, she would, for lack of a better term, rub my back. It was a feeling like when someone's hand is as close to your skin as it can get without actually touching it. This is a second-hand story in that I heard it from the people who were there when it happened. There's a belief that every good theatre has a ghost. And Boyce Little Theatre in Boyce, Idaho has at least one ghost, but probably two. The reason I say two is because the original building the theatre was in burned down during a performance and two of the patrons died in the fire. I don't know how ghost logic works, but the ghost came with everything that was salvageable to the new theatre. Personally, I've seen lights turn on behind the stage 
and I remember our costuming woman found a box of costumes appear in a locked room from nowhere and no one ever knew where they came from. We liked our ghosts. One night, a couple of years before I was there, there was a rehearsal going on. Because it was just a rehearsal, the only entrance in the back was chained and locked. The front doors were the only way in. And there were people wandering around doing various things all over the theater all night. No one was getting into that theater without being seen or heard. Everyone was taking a break and eating pizza in the seats, except for one of the actors, three to four year old daughter, who was playing on the stage. That's when the trap doors opened under the girl. From the top of the stage to the concrete floor below is about a 14 foot drop. A three to four year old girl falling 14 feet with nothing to stop her but the concrete floor. You expect the worst. Everyone jumps up and turns, runs to the back. Some going to the right of the stage, some going left. The way the theater is arranged it only takes five to 10 seconds to get to the door going under the stage while running. They get below the stage and they find her standing under the trap door, not a scratch on her. When her parents ask her what happened, all she would say is, a nice man caught me. My mom told her sister she will celebrate every birthday of hers. Her sister died of brain cancer. Years ago, back when it was flip phones and text messages cost money per text, my mom got something super weird on her phone. A lot of years had passed since her sister's death. It was me and her driving home at night from the mall or something. Suddenly, my mom's phone starts going off and weird shit was happening to it. She got a message on her phone that said, Kelly, with a picture of my sister from my stepdad, who didn't even know how to work a phone back then. She named my sister Kelly after her sister. Then I was like, what the fuck? I didn't know you could even get text messages, let alone even know how to text. I immediately called my stepdad while in the car with my mom, asking him why he sent that. He was freaked out and said there's no way he sent that at all. Then I hang up and my mom starts to cry and says it's her sister Kelly's birthday. As soon as she said that, all the lights in her van turned on at once, super bright. My mom started to cry harder while driving and said we have to sing happy birthday to her. We both started singing and the lights flickered to the song and at the end of the happy birthday song, the lights flicked really fast. We both started to cry and the lights turned on once more and my mom said, Kelly, I'm driving down the highway. Please turn off the lights. I don't want to get pulled over. I love you. And then everything went out. It was the most shocking moment I ever experienced. My mom bawled her eyes out the whole way home. Around the summer of 2012 to 2013, when I was about 13-ish, I spent the summer in South Dakota with my uncle from the middle of June to the middle of August. During my time, him and I had quite a few interesting adventures accidentally macing ourselves, being charged by a grizzly bear, driving home through a tornado. But this one is the one that I can't stop thinking about. Towards the end of my stay, we decided that we would go on one last hike. We had been hiking a few times beforehand, Yellowstone and Bear Brute, and figured we could squeeze in one more. He suggested going for roughly a five to six mile overnight camp and hike in Cloud Peak Wilderness, Wyoming. When we got there, we hiked for about three miles on trail before he suggested going off trail for a little bit. At some point, we came across an opening that had a medium sized lake, a waterfall, and flat rock surfaces mixed with the surrounding woods. We decided to set up camp for the night near the rock surfaces, but still on soft forest ground. We set up the tent, a small contained fire, and hung up our food supplies to avoid any nosy critters. During the night, we heard a variety of noises. From twigs snapping, owls hooting, and one of the scarier ones, wolves howling in the distance. My uncle brought his fifth generation iPod, the first ones that were able to play videos and movies. He put on Star Wars A New Hope. We're both people who can't sleep without background noise, and frankly, the background noises of the forest at night was starting to make me feel slightly unsettled. I fell asleep within about 20 to 30 minutes of the movie starting. When I woke up, the movie was over and the screen was black, 
but it was still very dark out, so I didn't know what time it was. Within two minutes of waking up, I hear a loud clicking sound. It was fast and rhythmic, but not repetitive. It doesn't ever sound the same as the last phrase. My brain jumped to woodpecker immediately, but then I remembered that they don't peck at night. It seemed to be getting louder. My heart was beginning to race and I was starting to freeze up. To my horror, the clicking sound started multiplying, now coming from every direction. Some were close, some sounded like they could have been miles away. From what I could, it sounded like there was possibly seven or eight distinct areas where the sound was coming from. My uncle awoke in the uproar of the sounds. He froze as soon as he sat up. His breathing became heavy and he was noticeably terrified. He's a big dude and I've never seen him like this. So if he reacts that way, I definitely don't know if my fear is valid. We both looked at each other in absolute horror and confusion. The clicking sounds weren't nearly hurting our ears at this point, but all of a sudden through the sound, there was a gunshot in the distance, followed by a loud screech. The only way I can describe it, it was like a lion's roar mixed with a woman's blood curdling scream. The air became still. Everything became instantly silent. The only sound remaining being my breath and the breeze. My uncle and I just sat there, shocked for what felt like hours, but was probably only two to three minutes. After we were able to gain some self-control, we decided the only thing we could do was go back to sleep. Obviously, that wasn't happening. So I laid there for maybe three hours just listening to the still, silent atmosphere. Once morning broke, we packed up as fast as we could, not speaking a single word, and hiked back. We tried to remember the way in which we had gotten there, but for some reason, nothing looked familiar. We berated each other with questions, trying to maybe spark a memory. Nothing worked, and we couldn't recall a single detail of our hike beyond the point of being on the trail. We hiked for six hours, hoping that the direction we were heading was right. Eventually, we found some light relief when we noticed the trail. We saw a trail sign and looked at it to try to figure out where we were. We were confused when we noticed that we were still two miles from where we parked. How? How did we hike for so long and still be two miles out when we only planned for a five to six mile hike? We got back to the car and drove home. Once home, we searched for the area where we camped and we actually were able to find it. What I didn't understand was that it was 22 miles from where we parked and yet somehow we don't remember anything about the hike. To this day, we don't really talk about it that much. We have some sort of unspoken agreement to acknowledge that what happened wasn't normal. And I think we're still to this day trying to process it. This was and still is one of the most terrifying and strange experiences of my life. So, what the hell happened that day and night? If anyone has any theories or similar experiences, please share them. When I was in ninth grade walking to the bus stop near St. Paul, Minnesota, it was still dark out and eerily calm. No traffic and very quiet. But the second I stepped onto the street from my driveway, it felt like there was some kind of mild static energy in the air, if that makes sense. Anyways, my bus stop was half a block from my house on the corner, with one streetlight above it and some pine trees and shrubs that lined the street. I was looking at the ground as I walked up the hill toward the bus stop, and just before I crossed the street, I finally looked up to see if the kid I shared this bus stop with was already there. He wasn't. Instead, standing directly under the streetlight, was this maybe three and a half foot tall alien? Facing its body toward me, staring at me. I stopped in my tracks and stared for a second, paralyzed with fear. This thing was like three and a half feet tall with gray, blue, whitish skin. I could see blue veins under its skin, which seemed almost translucent or thin. No clothing, no hair at all, with no noticeable genitalia. Its head was large with sort of a flattish top that became bulbous around the forehead area, tapered in a bit at the temple area, then bulbous cheekbone area, then tapered down to a flattish chin. And the eyes were larger and more spaced out than human eyes. I didn't see a nose 
and the mouth was like a small slit, no lips, and closed. The arms were too long for its body, and hung at its side. I guess I didn't take note of its hands. It kind of had a flat chest with small pectoral muscles, but no nipples, with a wider protruding lower stomach, wide set hips, short legs, and looked more like how when a hooved animal stands on their hind legs, but with humanoid feet. This thing just stood there under the streetlight facing me and staring at me, and only 20 to 30 feet away from me. I would guess I stood there for maybe 3 to 5 seconds staring at it, frozen with fear and confusion, trying to figure out what the fuck I was staring at. When my brain caught up with me, I ran as fast as I could back home, slammed the door shut and was inconsolably crying and hyperventilating. My parents were confused and horrified as to what happened to me in the three minutes I was gone. My mom had to literally help me walk to the nearest chair. I didn't go to school that day. My dad stayed home because I was too scared to be alone. After I calmed down, I took a nap and woke up fucking eight hours later to my mom when she got home from work. It felt like I had literally just closed my eyes, then opened them to my mom, who had worked an entire shift at work. This is long, and hopefully I explained it well enough. Scariest day of my life. Also, when my mom was a little kid, her early teens, she had several encounters, including abduction. She hates talking about it, but my god, her stories are absolutely terrifying. My mom grew up on a farm girl in rural Wisconsin. Who wouldn't make this shit up? Please keep in mind, I'm a complete skeptic, constantly finding ways to practically explain my weird experiences. At this time in my life, I was in a very dark place. Because of my self-esteem was at an all-time low, my choices were sometimes very imprudent. I met this guy on the Hot or Not dating website, today's equivalent of Tinder. His name was listed as Abe Lincoln, and he was in his early 20s, which was a bit younger than me. He even seemed immature to me on the website, so I'm not sure what I was thinking in even giving this guy the time of day. We set up at a very well-known sports bar in Colorado. I was at least wise enough to not let him pick me up from home. The second I said hi and gave him a hug, it was like something punched me in the gut. I had a horrible feeling about this guy, but I thought, hey, what could possibly go wrong in a well-lit, highly populated area? We walked in, and it was particularly sparse for being a Friday night. As we walked down the main central aisle, headed toward the back area, Abe was leading the way as I hung back a little. Suddenly, something unseen physically hit me hard, and I mean hard, on the right side of my head. So hard that my hair whipped up over the top of my head, and over to the left side of my head. Not only did it shock me, but it hurt. I naturally whipped around in a complete 360 to look everywhere behind me and on both sides of me. There was nothing I could have run into, as the eye was very wide, and there was absolutely no one there, at least in the physical sense. I was stunned, and couldn't for the life of me figure out why or what had just happened. Was it someone from the other side, trying to warn me of something bad to come? Or was it something darker? Something that just wanted to mess with me? I get how completely stupid this sounds. I'll say that the more I talked to this guy through the evening, the more I saw that he was a very scary individual. He told me very weird things about himself that caused a hundred red flags to pop up. I was terrified from the event that happened earlier, and I was completely paranoid the entire time, looking all around me, afraid of another unseen assault. Although my feelings about myself were not so great, my instincts were sharp, and I somehow felt I was important enough to tell him I needed to leave. Did I escape something dreadful about to happen? Did I get backhanded by a loved one from the other side who knew what would happen if I stayed any longer with Mr. Lincoln? Or was this just a random dark entity deciding to hit me just for the hell of it in the most random of places? I'll never know. Years ago, my friend and I would go explore haunted locations all over Connecticut. Although we never really saw anything, it was always fun to bop around the state and see new sites. One of these adventures took us to my hometown, which is a small tobacco farming community. 
barns litter the landscape. Some were new, while others have stood longer than I've been alive. Being from a small town, everyone knew each other, and most worked on the tobacco fields during their youth. My father was one of those individuals who could recall many memories from his time at a local farm. One of these memories consisted of a man who would walk around in the rafters in a large barn in the back of the field. Many of the workers have seen the same man, but few knew who he actually was. It got to the point where my father grew curious enough to ask about him. His face turned white when he heard it was the ghost of a man who hung himself from the barn ceiling. Fast forward to the present ghost tour my friend and I were on. We set off looking for this barn. Gaining access to the fields was easy, since the owners were family friends who granted us permission. We joked how the drive up to the backfield was reminiscent of a horror movie, due to the ground being muddy from previous storms during the week, and lightning lit off the sky as a new storm approached us. To help navigate, I opened Google Maps to have an aerial view of the property. I could see the barn on the map, long since collapsed, buried deep in the forest, and difficult to see from the road but I said nothing to my friend about its true location. It wasn't until we were by it that a sudden, heavy feeling hit both our chest and quickly faded away once we drove past it. She turned and asked if that was it, to which I replied yes. Both of us were spooked, but wanted to get a good visual of the barn, so we turned around. As we parked, the car with the headlights facing into the forest to try to illuminate the barn's remains, the heavy feeling returned, but a lot stronger. It got to a point where we had to leave because it felt angry. It was at that moment a shadow appeared in the brush in front of the barn. It was in the shape of a man, but it stood there watching us. Now panicking, we tried to rush out of the fields, almost getting stuck in the mud in the process. That feeling of anger and dread stayed with us until we left the farm's property. The drive back to my house was silent as the storm was now upon us, unleashing a wall of rain. The first words spoken upon our arrival were to my father. These words still ring in my ear today. You were right. Last night at around 1am, I saw an apparition float from my bedroom closet and out of my main bedroom door. I was laying in bed with my girlfriend while she was asleep, watching Oh Brother Where Art Thou? The movie was at the part when the girls were in the river, giving the main characters moonshine. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw it floating from my closet and travelling semi-fast out of my bedroom door. It looked like a fog or exhaust on a cold day or a ghost, but in a rectangle form without the edges. I woke my girlfriend up immediately to tell her, and tears started to pour down my eyes. I was in complete shock. My whole life has been shocking, since now I know ghosts are real. I felt like I wanted to throw up. I even called and told my mom at ten past two in the morning. I'm a grown-ass man with a six-year-old daughter. My girlfriend's grandpa died exactly two months earlier, at five past two a.m. And his ashes are in a mini urn in the closet, where I saw the apparitions originate from. Then today, I grilled steak for dinner for my family, girlfriend, three girl daughters. When I brought it in from the grill, I covered it with foil. Before I went to uncover it, there was a huge fog, mist or distortion all around me, right in front of me. I could barely see the counters and cabinets in the kitchen. That happened for about five seconds, then went away. I told my girlfriend, and she said that her grandpa really liked steak, and was freaked the fuck out. I don't want to just assume it's my girlfriend's grandpa, because of the two month anniversary, Minnie Earn and his love for steak. Something definitely happened. I was always super sceptical, and now I just don't know what to think. I'm still in shock, and it's really messing with my mind. Does anyone have any insight on what this is, or what I can do? Is this what a ghost really is? It hasn't moved anything, controlled lights, or touched anybody in the house. We live in an old apartment. This happened like seven years ago. I was invited to a party by my best friend at the time, in his house, which had pretty awesome views of the city, especially at night. I was pretty bored, so I asked my dad to pick me up and sure he did. It was like 9.30pm or so when he picked me up. We were in the car 
and we were talking about some kind of nonsense, just having fun and enjoying the city lights and night sky. Suddenly, my dad recognised one of the houses in the neighbourhood and told me it was where an old college friend used to live and I heard the story. Then everything went black. The next thing I remember was us still in the car. My dad stops when he realises that somehow we were going in circles when we passed again by that old friend's house. The thing is, we were going downhill to take one of my main roads again, so if we were going in circles, we would notice we were going uphill. Somehow, we were brought uphill. We have no recollection whatsoever and about half an hour lost. When we got home, we were still so confused and kind of in shock. I remember feeling anxious and a bit afraid without knowing why. The next morning, I noticed some bruises on my shoulders and my neck that I couldn't explain. My dad also had some bruises, but I don't remember the exact places. We still cannot remember anything of that lost time. This happened a few months ago. I don't remember the exact date because I tried so hard to forget about the experience, but a month ago, it surfaced again. It was pretty late at night, between 4 and 5 a.m. I fell asleep with my cell phone right beside me and I felt it vibrate. It wasn't that unusual for me to be woken up like this. On weekends, I get up pretty late and my parents call me to wake me up or to make sure I'm up and getting ready to go and get lunch somewhere. But it was in the middle of the night and it was coming from my grandparents. I immediately answered, thinking there was an actual emergency. My grandparents are 90 and 89, and my youngest uncle who lives with them has Down syndrome. They're pretty much vulnerable to a bunch of things. When I answered the phone, my grandpa was on the other side of the line, and his voice sounded as if he was answering the phone to me, and immediately told him who I was, and asked him if everything was okay. He sounded confused, which I didn't think was a big deal. He has trouble with hearing because of his age, and I thought he just forgot to put his hearing aids on. But then he started screaming and the phone call ended. All this happened in the course of a minute or so. I immediately tried to call back, absolutely terrified of something happening to them. After three non-answered calls, I was on the edge of a panic attack if I didn't have one already. I got out of my room and woke up my dad. I told him what happened and showed him the call record on my phone so he couldn't brush it off saying to me it was just a nightmare. I begged him to call them just to make sure everything was okay. He told me he'd do it and to go to bed. I didn't sleep much that night. I was absolutely terrified, at times imagining the worst, but also analysing what happened and thinking of a logical explanation. But nothing makes sense to me. My grandpa is not the most technological guy. He's pretty old school in that way. My grandma is the one that uses their cell phone or their landline to communicate with us. I'm not really my grandpa's favourite, and I don't know how I would be the first to be contacted if something happened. For me, it's pretty hard to comprehend how the man that doesn't even know how to spell my name correctly knows my phone number. I have to add, also, that my grandpa is a very respected doctor, who's won several awards and is the most healthy person I've known in my entire life. He hasn't lost any of his marbles, he's pretty aware and conscious about his surroundings. In the early morning, my dad called and my grandma answered. Fortunately, everything was okay. And my grandma assured him nobody called me that night. My dad kind of tried the you were just dreaming speech. But once again, I showed him the call I received and that I actually talked to someone. He's a logical man and he would try to give me an explanation, but this time he didn't even try. He was so freaked out that he pretended this conversation never happened and continued with his day. I made my entire family check their phones so we could make sure nobody was called that night and that it was just me who received a creepy phone call. I buried that memory on the remotest corner of my brain, hoping it never popped up again, and I just forgot it. I remember when I was a kid that every school was built over a cemetery cliché but my elementary school actually was built over one. Ever since I was a little girl, I was heavily interested in the paranormal, and I always thought my school had something weird going on. And for some reason, I was invested in proving to myself that I was right. In fourth grade, my experiments began. 
I purposefully stayed later in my classroom, hoping something would happen. I was always alone for like 10 minutes every day in the classroom, and I waited for like 5 minutes in silence to hear something. I was slowly getting frustrated and decided to drop my experiments. One day it happened. I was alone in my classroom putting some things away in my locker space as quickly as possible so I could join my friends on the patio. My classroom was at the end of the hallway on the second floor so I was hurrying to catch up. I could hear the muffled voices of the other kids outside. In one instant it was like a crowd of people talking out loud just hit me in the ears. I couldn't understand a bit of what they were saying but it was louder than a bunch of kids playing outside. I grabbed my backpack and ran outside. When I was just by the stairs, I closed my backpack and walked to meet my friends. I was freaked out, but I didn't say anything to anyone. I didn't want a bunch of other kids to stay late in the classroom with me, and if someone told a teacher, they would think I was doing it for attention. Some weeks passed, and I wasn't staying late anymore because I didn't want to hear those voices again. One day, I thought it would be interesting to leave a piece of paper with a message for the ghosts hidden behind my books. I made sure nobody was there and that nobody could see it at plain sight. And sure enough, I received answers written in the paper. There were simple sentences and yes, no answers. Since my mum was a teacher at my school, I was the first kid to arrive at the classroom. So before anyone else would come, I would open my message and see the answer. Eventually, I stopped doing that because it felt wrong and I could tell the ghosts were getting a bit annoyed. It wasn't much, but it was enough that made me believe in ghosts and made me think I was as awesome as those ghost hunters on TV. This story takes place during the late summer in the 1960s in Osceola, Iowa which was a very small farming community. My friend's great-grandpa, Bob, owned a farm out there. He had acres of corn, wheat, potatoes, etc. But corn was his main crop, so he had a huge cornfield. It was around 2am and his grandfather couldn't sleep. So he went outside to get some fresh air. When outside, he noticed something that looked like a child walking around in the cornfield. So, Bob ran back inside and grabbed his double barrel shotgun and woke the farmhand for a backup. They combed through the cornfield in an attempt to find whatever was running around out there. After a while, they still couldn't find anything, so Bob told the farmhand to go back inside the house while he stayed on the porch to watch his cornfield. Then, he looked at the gravel road between his yard and the fence line that led to the cornfield, and standing on the road was a little girl, around six years old or so and she was wearing a white dress that made her look like she had just gotten out of church. Bob thought that his mind must have been playing tricks on him, so he tried to lay down on the couch to rest, but also to stay somewhat alert. However, not even a minute after he laid down, he heard a knock on the screen door. He walked up to the door and slightly cracked the main door open. He saw the little girl and asked, May I help you? The little girl said, Mister, I'm lost, and I don't know where my parents are. Can I come in the house and use your telephone? Bob felt uneasy and told her that he could get her a glass of water. And he can call her parents for her if she gave him the number. But he didn't feel comfortable letting her inside. He felt something off about the little girl. However, the little girl insisted on being the one to call and talk to them. And Bob said, young lady, it's two in the morning and I don't feel comfortable letting a stranger into the house, little girl or not. The little girl started to get agitated and said, I'm not leaving until you let me in and use your phone. Startled, Bob told the little girl that he was going to call the police to come pick her up so they could keep her safe and find her parents. He closed the door to go and call the police and he heard somebody punch the door like a grown man. He walked back and cracked the door open again but when he looked, he realised that it was the little girl that punched the door. But when he looked at her this time, she didn't have any eyes. Instead, she had pitch black orbs instead of eyes, and she said in a deep voice, Let. Me. In. So Bob grabbed his shotgun and pointed it at the little girl and told her no, and to go away. After this, the little girl looked right into the barrel and then back up at Bob, smiled smugly at him and giggled, and then she ran back into the cornfield and disappeared. So 
So back in December 2017, I had finally found a new place to live and was moving out of my ex fiance's apartment. It was in this student housing complex that has a ton of houses in it and you lease out the rooms. Anyway, I was 20 at the time and took over the lease for this other girl that lived there. I moved into this four bed, four and a half bath house that was two stories. Three other girls lived there with me that I didn't know. It started out as smoothly as it could, given that I had to literally real build my life and I was in a strange new house with people I didn't know. Nothing really happened to me at first. However, it was certainly gradual. Probably the first thing I noticed was the air and atmosphere felt thick and heavy all the time, and I never felt like I was alone. I constantly felt fear or some other negative emotion. I just thought this was because of my situation, and I would get over it once I bounced back. It didn't. Then, I would hear clawing, scratching and thudding at random times. My bedroom was on the top floor, and the door to the attic was just outside my room. We called maintenance on multiple occasions to get an exterminator out. They finally checked it out and couldn't find a single thing wrong in the attic. No nests, droppings, dead animals, insects, etc. Then, the breaker box would constantly have to be reset. Every single day, the breaker would have to be reset at least three times, but it was usually more. How it would happen is a section of lights would turn off in one room. We would reset the breaker for whatever room it was, and then it would be a different set of lights. We would reset it and wash, rinse, repeat several times a day. It didn't matter the time of year, weather or anything. We finally had the complex get an electrician out there, and he said there was nothing wrong with our breaker box or anything like that. It was absolutely terrifying. Sometimes you'd be in the bathroom or shower and the lights would just go off in your bathroom and that's it. There was no rhyme or reason. Another thing that started happening was things would fly off my wall. I would never see it admittedly, but I knew they did just based on how and where they landed and what the object was. Whatever the entity was, it did not like my Mardi Gras mask that I had on my shelf. There was no reason for this thing to fall off I had it anchored to the shelf with hooks and a stopper in front of it. Either way, sometimes I would turn around or walk in my room, even if I just left for a few minutes and find this mask six to ten feet away from the shelf. Doesn't make sense because it was heavy and an odd shape, so it shouldn't have been able to roll that far if it somehow just magically fell off. Side note, my room is carpeted, so that adds another obstacle. I wanted to test it, so I put a lot of noisy plastic stuff right underneath the shelf. Cellophane mostly, but anything that was loud, crinkly, and I would definitely hear. But I never heard it fall onto that pile of cellophane, even though it continued to wind up like 6 to 10 feet away from the shelf. There was a lot of minor things as well. Drops in temperature, shadows, whispering downstairs, but we could never tell what they were saying. My roommates all got sleep paralysis. It would always be one of their worst fears. I never slept well. Things would disappear and reappear, strange sounds, etc. Another thing is I find and resell various oddities. So I had a vintage Ouija board there, but I sold it within the same week I got it. Never even opened the thing. Just sold it as to make a profit. During the first few days I had it, I would awaken at night and as crazy as it seems, something was telling me to open it and play with it. Felt like the thoughts weren't my own because I've never and would never play with one. I never caved in, but I thought that was odd. However, it started coming to a head after I'd been there a few months, and it was just before summer break. My roommates had a big party there, and I invited a friend to it. My friend told me years later that when they went downstairs after the party, about 4am it was so, to get some water, they said that they heard hundreds of flies flying towards them, but they couldn't see any. And they said while this happened, the room smelled of rotting meat. There weren't any flies or rotting meat in this house, FYI. So we moved out of that house after our lease was up, and we moved to another house within the same complex, and haven't had any problems. Still creeped out when I drove by the house on Winter Park Drive. I'm honestly torn between the lanky, well-dressed man with a face made of shadows and 
the thing that waits at the threshold. Both have their pros and cons. They actually both showed up at the same time once. I keep a journal of my sleep paralysis episodes. Here's the time they both showed up. The entry is from July 14th, 2019. For context, I work at a group home where I sometimes have to spend the night. Occasionally, I'm able to sleep while I'm there. Occasionally, I bring my dog with me. I was lying on my air mattress at work, trying to sleep. The room didn't look right. It was cold and I could see my breath. It was almost pitch dark, but I could still see everything clearly. The lanky, well-dressed man with a face made of static and shadows mocks me. I know something worse is coming. I left the doors open with screen doors shut before I went to bed because it was maddeningly hot. And that's how it's going to get in. I need to get up. I need to shut the door. Something worse is coming. I can hear his footfalls outside the big window in the living room here at work. It's on the front lawn. Every time it steps down on the grass, I can feel an external sense of coldness radiating through the world from that direction. Like it's cold, but it's a cold that isn't localized within my body that I'm not experiencing with my nerves. I'm feeling frozen footsteps that flow into my brain from outside the house. The lanky, well-dressed man with a face made of static and shadows asks if I'm really going to just lie there and let the other come in through the door I left open. He says the horseshoe above the door won't be enough to stop it. I try to scream and can't. I try to get up and can't. I try to turn my head and it happens so, so slowly. And it takes so much effort for every millimetre of turning I manage. It feels like trying to push my face through a concrete wall, except it's working, but too slow. I try to move my arms. I try to stand up. My body shifts ever so slightly and the effort is exhausting. Frozen footsteps. I can see the mist of its breath coming through the screen door. The lanky, well-dressed man with a face made of shadows raises a wine glass in toast. The thing is at the door. It sees me. I see it. I'm freezing and its eyes are so very cold. Then my dog woke up with a start up from where he was sleeping. He made a warning sort of growl, came over to me and started licking my face. Then he put a paw on my chest and wagged his tail and pawed at me and was adorable. The lanky man went away and I didn't see how. I could still feel the thing in the doorway looking at me, but I ignored it because of the adorable little cocker spaniel. Then the thing in the doorway went away too and I was finally able to move. I got up and shut both doors and then locked them. I briefly considered checking the horseshoe that was above the door on the outside but then decided I didn't really want to know if something had happened to it. I'm a student at a pontifical university in the Philippines. Being a student in the university means that you most likely have knowledge of the various ghost stories in the campus. I used to have a dorm right next to university until Corona came and also am usually active at night. I had two weird encounters in all of my university life. First, as the usual routine goes, I go to the internet cafe mostly every night to game or study often staying until 3 to 4 a.m. I usually do this alone and would usually take the route through the university to reach the internet cafe. University's gates close around 10 p.m., so I make sure that I'll be able to reach the internet cafe by then. As I walk past the university gates at 9 o'clock, I took a long walk trying to get ready for my sitting session later. I was approaching a fountain and arc when I realized I wasn't alone. I was walking along the corridor of trees when I noticed two people were sitting by a certain tree. I felt disturbed as I spotted them because the ground where they sat was probably mud. I picked up the pace a bit after I slowed down. I heard one of them laugh and two sets of footsteps trail behind me. I was immensely disturbed and my heart felt heavy. They were chasing me. Maybe I violated their privacy or they were the type of people who would ask for a fight, I'm not sure. 
When I approached the end of the corridor, I turned around and saw no one was ever following me. I didn't want to stay and ran towards the gate near the internet cafe. I approached a guard and reported the two people and he told his colleague he was re readying for a patrol. Looks like it isn't only you. Second, I heard my assignment partner was busy doing her part at the library, so I decided to check it out. When I reached the place, I found out she was with a boyfriend who wanted to help. Her boyfriend and I went and tried searching for the book, while she stayed to read what she gathered. He found the first and fourth books on the list, while I found the third. Still looking for the second on the list, he told me he'd ask the librarian who was walking around the bookcases. He disappeared while looking after her. I found the book before he even returned and decided to head back after sending him a text. I got to meet my partner again and we waited for her boyfriend to return. After a few minutes, he did return but he was teary eyed and his skin pores were acting up. He said that the librarian he saw was in one of the portraits of the staff a few decades ago. My partner told him that what he experienced was one of the few ghost rumours in the library. I had doubts. Maybe it was the librarian's kid who identically looked like the one he saw. My mom grew up in a small house in the middle of nowhere. The home is located in the middle of a forest that was previously Chickasaw tribe land. My grandparents bought the home in the 50s or 60s and relatively nothing is known about the home prior to them moving in. As a young girl, she lived there with my grandparents and her three sisters, along with family pets. From the time she was six, she would have recurring dreams of a woman crawling on all fours to the foot of a bed and then violently jumping into the bed with her. My family dismissed these dreams as the workings of a child's overactive imagination, with the exception of my grandmother and one of the aunts who we will refer to as Kay. These two had always felt uneasy in the home and saw my mom's dreams as validation to the negative energy surrounding them. The dreams that my mom would have of this woman occurred frequently and each one was the same. Same woman, same path to the bed, same conclusion. They continued to live there until my mom was around 12, at which point they moved into a home closer to my grandfather's job. The old home was kept as a rental property since it had long been paid off. My mom was still having the dreams and my grandmother hoped that the new home would offer my mom and her some well needed rest from the dream. Unfortunately for them, this was not the case and the dreams began occurring more and more frequently. By the time my mother was 14, the dream would happen every single night. My mom was doing bad in school and the family was beginning to grow tired of the screaming that would come from my mother's room at all hours of the night. Kay had moved away by this point as she is about 10 years older than my mom. Kay was visiting home on weekend and had nowhere to sleep since the new home was smaller than the previous one and so she had to sleep with my mom. At some point on the first night, Kay woke up because she could hear my mom moaning in her sleep. She sat up in the bed as my mom's moans got louder and louder and Kay began to hear the sound of trotting coming down the hallway. Obviously, this scared the shit out of her, but curiosity got the best of her and she continued listening as the trotting got louder. When the sound was essentially on top of them, my mother sat up straight in the bed, panting and crying. The sound had stopped, but Kay still felt uneasy. She went to try and console my mom, but at that moment, it felt to them like something large leapt onto the foot of the bed. This sent both of them into a screaming fit that I'm sure woke everyone up in the neighborhood. According to Kay, whatever jumped onto the foot of the bed stayed there until my grandfather came into the room to see why they were wailing. Kay told this story to my grandparents that night and it convinced my grandfather to call their pastor to the home the next day. The pastor blessed the home and my mom in an attempt to get rid of whatever this was. The blessing worked for a time, but it was not an end or be end all. Life for my mom after the pastor did this blessing improved a bit. The dream stopped becoming an everyday thing and eventually 
became something that would only happen once every couple of years. In October of 2008, my parents divorced and my mom became a single mother of two during one of the worst recessions in decades. We were flat broke with nowhere to live and my grandparents offered to let us move in to the old family home rent free. My grandmother wasn't too thrilled about us living in that house, but she knew that we had no other option. My aunt Kay was already living there in one of the bedrooms and my grandmother felt better about us being there with Kay, keeping a watchful eye out. The day we moved in was a sad and stressful day for all of us. My mom was on edge and young me was oblivious to all the bad history that my family had with the home. One of the most prominent things in my mind when I think of that place is the stench of the water. The stuff was littered with sulfur and would stink up any room where the tap was on. We couldn't wash clothes in the home because it would dye them a yellowish orange colour and it was certainly not safe to drink. The house was far from a mansion with three small bedrooms and only one bathroom. Me, my sister and my mom slept in the master bedroom located in the back of the house across from the bathroom. This bedroom was isolated from the rest of the home by one of the other bedrooms which had been converted into an office space for my aunt Kay. Daytime in the home was relatively normal with only the slight feeling of anticipation for the night to come. The moment that the sun went down, the entire personality of the property switched into a sinister and angry being that loomed over everyone. It was a rule for most of the family that they would not be caught dead there after the sunset. I only recently learned of this rule and was furious that anyone let us live there knowing that it was no place for children or even adults for that matter. One of the earliest experiences that I can recall occurred only about a week after we moved in. I was in the kitchen with Kay while she was making dinner for the two of us. My mom and sister were at my grandparents' house helping them clean up after a yard sale. As she was making dinner, we heard a sound like furniture being moved coming from the office. Being the inquisitive child I was, I went to investigate the sound but found nothing out of place. I returned to my spot at the kitchen table while Kay finished up dinner. As she sat down, we heard the sound of air rushing like the house had taken a deep breath in. At that moment, as we sat there silently staring at each other, the drawers and cabinets in the kitchen flung open, spilling silverware, pots, pans, and other miscellaneous kitchen junk into the floor. I immediately burst into tears, as any child would, while Kay tried her best to console me. I cried and cried that night, unable to grasp what had happened. To this day, the sound of a pot hitting something induces a panic attack. Little things would happen in the home that no one would quite explain. Lights would flicker, doors would open and close, and random knocks would occur, not seeming to originate from one fixed point. The next major event that happened was on my sister's birthday. My whole family was over celebrating at the home, but as night approached, most of the family cleared out according to their rule. By sunset, all that were left were me, my mom, my sister, Kay, my grandparents, my Kay's daughter B. We were cleaning up the house after the party when the door to the office slammed shut. No one was in that part of the house, so we were confused as to how the door had shut. My grandfather went to investigate and found that he couldn't open the door, which was a little unsettling as there was no lock on the door. Attached to the office was a closet, when was a conjoined closet with Kay's room in the front of the house. The passage was narrow and they had to send someone small enough to fit in the small gap. You guessed it, that was me. I made my way through the closet and into the office where I found myself staring at the door and trembling. Something had pushed a small bookshelf against the door and jammed it under the handle. I pushed and pushed on the shelf trying to clear the door and that's when I heard it. It started off quiet and distant, but grew louder with every passing second. The sound of trotting. I panicked and started kicking the shelf with all of my might, and thankfully it budged. I flung the door open and ran straight to my grandfather and held on to him like my life depended on it. I'd love to say that that was the end of it and that we promptly moved out of that hellhole, but that would make me a liar. We stayed in that home for another two years. Well, saying we would also be a lie. I had one more experience not long after my sister's party 
that caused me to practically move in with my grandparents. Being that the house was so small, my sister and I slept with my mom in the master bedroom in her king-sized bed that she got in the divorce. My mom had started frequently having the dream, but didn't tell anyone that she had until years later. One night, we were asleep, and I woke up because I heard my mom moaning. I sat up and looked around the room to see nothing out of place, and then I started to hear a sound coming from the closet. It sounded like a tapping at first that just kept getting louder. I woke my mom up and she could hear the sound too. She told me it was nothing and to go back to sleep. I tried, I really did, but that sound would not stop. Eventually I got fed up with the sound and had decided that I was going to see what it was and stop it. I think I convinced myself that it was a necklace or something clanging against some of the shelving in the closet. I approached the crack door to investigate when a loud thump came from the back of the closet, followed by a quick running sound. The door then slammed shut and all was still and quiet. That was it, the last straw. The next day, I went to live with my grandparents and would only visit my mom on weekends. The few times that I stayed overnight in the home in the following two years, I would sleep with my aunt Kay, never daring to enter my mom's room. These experiences have stuck with me. Now, I'm in my early 20s and have developed a morbid curiosity around life after death. My mom still has the dreams years later, and it may all be in my head, but I've had them too. They're not frequent, and have only happened a few times, but each time they do happen, I sleep with the lights on for a few weeks afterwards. My cousins live in the home now and are moving out soon. I plan to go back to the home for a few nights and seek some kind of closure. I posted these stories in hope of finding someone else who's experienced these things before, and if so, what exactly is this thing? We've lived in our 1963 house since 2017. Since we've lived here, my husband has had many experiences with ghosts that are children. We have a four-year-old son, but it wasn't him making the noise. He said children calling out for mommy while our son was sleeping. My husband wakes up before me and our kid. He hears children running around the house at night. Also of note, we still have a nest camera in our kid's room. We should take it out soon, just because he's getting older. But with the ghost stuff, we haven't pulled the plug on it yet. We've confirmed it wasn't him making any of the noise. Last week at 6am while me and the kid were sleeping, my husband heard a music box and kids running around the house. We don't have a music box or anything that plays that type of music. When we first moved into the house, our son had reported a few instances of a male ghost. We didn't make a big thing out of it and we suspect he was dreaming because when checking the nest camera, he was asleep all night. But he would routinely talk about a man who was a lava monster. I would refer to anyone with burns or red skin at that age, and he'd talk to him. He said he wasn't very nice. He hasn't reported anything to use in the past year, but he wouldn't talk about this visitor for two years off and on. I've never had any experience in our house, and the ghosts don't seem bad. At least my son's visitor hasn't reappeared, who was suspicious. I burned sage a few times throughout the house, but that didn't seem to do anything and would tell spirits to move on or leave. To our knowledge, no children have died in the house unless it's before the house was built. There have only been three owners before us and one of those was the daughter of the original owner. She inherited it from her parents. I live in Singapore, and on one random day, my friends and I decided to explore an abandoned place that we visited a few years back, but this time, we decided to explore at night. As usual, I packed my camera gear and all my equipment and filmed the entire time we were exploring in the abandoned place. If you guys would like to research on the place more, feel free to google abandoned Brunei hostel in Singapore. Something about that night made the place and vibes really strange. As soon as we started exploring the place, I started to feel really uncomfortable in the venue. That night was really strange. Among my friends, I was the only one who heard a ladylike voice humming or singing, I don't know. I managed to capture it on tape, but it was really subtle. We continued exploring the place and fast forward to the end. We didn't see or encounter anything in person, 
mostly weird noises. To my surprise, I'm pretty sure I captured a ghost on camera. Basically, in Asia, we believe in a Malay ghost called the Pontianak. Not really sure about the history of the ghost, but you can Google it for yourself. It was really weird, because none of us noticed or saw the ghost in person, which explains why no one was overreacting, and we continued exploring the place. My friend and I decided one summer night to go to this place called the Slaughter House one evening. When I grew up, there were a lot of urban legends about this place and the road it was on, Empire Mine Road. The road was located in the Bay, Bay Area of California and the road was shut down after many accidents had happened and it was deemed unsafe. Although it was still open as a walkable trail, well we had decided to go alone. I know, two youngish girls at night in an abandoned place, not the smartest. In the past we'd gone in a group of four or five people and always found other explorers there, so we didn't think much of it and we felt pretty safe. I'd brought a film camera with me, hoping to capture something possibly otherworldly on film, to serve as evidence. I also brought my pocket knife just in case. There was a need and for peace of mind, because homeless people sometimes hung out, and there were always rumours of satanic rituals, although I knew the ritual rumour was most likely BS. We started the 20 minute walk to the slaughterhouse itself, and this time felt really different. About a minute or two into the walk, I felt heavy with dread and fear, but I didn't want to say anything and creep out my friend or seem like I was chickening out. We made it up to the final turn to a straight away where it sounded like we were next to a freeway. But at this point, we were at least a mile off from the nearest road. The loud sounds of cars and car doors closing were supposedly the remains of all the accidents that happened along that road, but I wasn't so sure. I just figured sounds were carried with the wind from the far away freeways and roads. We made it down the final stretch, then we hopped the fence and we were on the property. This place was very different from the last time. It looked as if it had burned and the buildings were blocked off by rubble, so there wasn't really much to do. I walked to buildings I had photographed at a previous visit for comparison and began joking to my friend as I started feeling a bit more comfortable. I don't remember what I was exactly doing, but I turned my back to the building. My friend stared at me and said, dead seriously, come here now. And I walked over like, what's the matter? Apparently, she had seen a dark figure with red eyes behind me. I didn't personally see it, so I don't know if this was to scare me or not. But as I stepped towards her, I saw a dark truck traveling the road we had just walked on. This was really weird because the road was gated off when we parked in front of the gate which meant no one could come through without moving our car. Our car had not been moved, so it would be nearly impossible for a car to get through. I can't stress this enough, but it would have been nearly impossible for a car to get past our car and the locked gate. The truck was dark and barely visible with no lights on, and it didn't make any sound like road or engine noise. This dark truck pulled up to the gate we had hopped, and we heard yelling to get off my property. We couldn't see anyone in the truck and it was barely lit up. As soon as it was there, it was gone and with no sound. Neither of us saw a gun, but we both swore we had one. I was like, let's get out before whoever or whatever comes back. I nearly ran the mile back and I'm not someone to run. Once we hit the final stretch, I could see what looked like police lights. We told each other just to remain calm and we'd be fine. Once we got there, the police greeted us politely and we returned the politeness, hoping to score points. They had said that they received a jumbled up call that was very odd, but what they caught was that there were people on the road. They seemed to be confused by the call as we were. My friend had said we were just walking the road to see the place at night, and never actually hopped the fence, and thank God they believed it. After a few insulting remarks of us being two females on a road at night, we were on our way. We stopped at a well-lit gas station, to catch our breath and agreed, never again. I no longer live near this area, but after that I'd swore I'd never go back, certainly not at night. I still think about this night and it perplexes me about everything that happened. I told myself that it was just the owner, but it doesn't make sense how they could have gotten through our car and that gate and the confusion the police had as well. 
In addition, many of the photos I took turned up as pitch black, even though I had flashlights and flash on. I had a few developments and looked normal, but I chalked it off to being a bad film, but the same thing happened with the pictures I took on my phone as well. Overall, this experience has puzzled me. When I was in middle school, I went to a friend's birthday sleepover, where we did the typical girl things, painted nails, did makeovers, and watched a movie. It was all normal, until my friend suggested we make a Ouija board. On a sheet of paper, we scribbled out yes, no, goodbye, along with numbers and the alphabet. She told us all the rules, and we nodded in agreement we would follow. I remember being scared and wanting to fit in, but also wondering if it was a good idea. I remember the first movement happened, and I looked across to the girl facing me, insisting she had moved it. She had said it was not her that moved the clear pebble we all were using as a planchette. We asked dumb questions like who we each liked and if our crushes liked us. Typical middle school girl things. I don't remember much of these sessions, other than a particular name, Wanda, and that we had asked her if she was a demon, and she had told us she was not. After a while, this was no longer scary, and we began to enjoy it more and more. I remember feeling so excited, like I just wanted to keep playing, as if it were a video game. The next day, I told my dad about it. My family was pretty open-minded about those things, so he wasn't mad or ashamed. He just wanted to make sure we were all safe about it. Fast forward, and I was in my first year of college, and I was over at a friend's place for her birthday, and she had talked about how she found a Ouija board and we should try it. I was a little hesitant, as now I realised the true implications of them. We eventually started setting boundaries, but I was still hesitant to believe that the planchette was moving. My friend asked questions like, when's my birthday, and what's my name? I shifted to questions not about myself, tending to ask about the entity rather than me. My friend suddenly asked if the spirit knew my deceased grandfather's name, and it spelled out Louis. I was in shock because none of my friends had known that. I know that I hadn't directed the planchette to the letters, so I was surprised to see that it was correct. Later on, another friend of mine said that she felt something grab her foot under the table. I was right next to her, and I didn't feel anything. At that point, I'm like, let's say goodbye and call it a night. It's all just too weird. I'd never had a truly bad experience, but it's still very creepy, to say the least. We went back into the woods, saw it again. So after some internal debate, I decided I was going to go back because otherwise it would eat me up not knowing what this was. When I first saw it, I had zero idea what it could be. I figured some drugged out or mentally ill man, a prankster or a sickly deformed animal. After letting it all settle though, there's no way any of that was the case. I was trying to justify it in my mind because I've always been a heavy sceptic of anything paranormal. Still am, to be fair. But I'm warming up to the idea that crawlers may actually exist. So I messaged three of my buddies, told them everything that happened in detail over text, and asked if they'd come look with me. Them being non-believers like me, and also just loving adventure and spooky stuff, were more than excited to go. Two of my friends have guns, and so do I, so we brought all them. The other friend was in charge of holding two flashlights to give us some light, one being a phone flashlight so we would be ready to take a picture at a moment's notice. We waited until about 9.30pm when it was completely dark out and headed down the same trail I did last time. My heart was pumping out of my chest but I felt more confident having friends. They were joking around and thought this was cool and I tried joking back a few times but the reality was I was pretty nervous. We walked the full one and a half miles I had planned on walking last time and didn't encounter a thing. We'd prepped for so long though and didn't want to give up quite yet, so we kept walking. About five to eight minutes later, at close to the two mile mark, we started hearing some noises way back in the woods. It wasn't close, but it was loud enough for us to take notice. I told my friend to turn off a flashlight for a second and we listened. Bipedal footsteps made their way closer to us. Still far, but definitely coming our way. 
sounded like they were wearing boots or something because the heaviness of the steps was quite loud. That, or there were a lot of leaves, which to be fair is a possibility. It was off the trail, so it's all woods back there. Once the footsteps made it to about 20 to 30 yards away, I called out asking if someone was there. The footsteps stopped, but only for a brief second. A second later, the bipedal footsteps turned to what sounded like something sprinting in all fours direction. My friend immediately turned on the flashlights, but there was nothing visible through the dense forest. At the beginning of the trail, the forest is pretty clear, but further back it gets a lot more dense, so it was hard to tell. Once he turned on the light, the footsteps stopped as well. None of my friends were talking. Paranormal believer or not, hearing that will scare the shit out of you. My friend unholstered his pistol and kept it by his side. He looked at me, and I could see he wasn't having a good time anymore. My friend holding the camera was visibly shaky, and was darting his glance between all of us. The third friend shortly after yelled into the woods that, I see you! Come out, stop fucking with us! We have guns and we'll shoot. I don't want to hurt you over some dumb joke. Come on now! We heard that sound again. I mentioned last time it sounded like a cackle. This time it was more of a yell, shriek or aggravated noise. I don't even know what to compare it to. I just know it gave me goosebumps. My friend immediately shot his gun into the woods, causing my ears to ring horribly due to me being right next to him. I couldn't hear for shit, but I noticed his gaze went from the spot we heard the footsteps from over to the right of that spot, about 90 degrees. I followed his gaze and for about half a second caught a glimpse of once again, a tall, human-like thing running on all fours behind a tree. He started walking towards that direction, but my friend with the flashlight stopped him. He made the point that it was a buckshot. The chances he missed were slim due to the fact that the tree it was next to was covered in evidence that the shot was on target. My friend made a scary point that we hadn't considered. What if it hit, but didn't hurt it? What if he was right? What if it took a shotgun hit and didn't even fall over? My estimate is that it was between 6 foot and 6 4, and maybe between 140 and 165 pounds. So if it could still run after that shot, it either didn't get hit, or it's not something we want to mess with. We hear the cackle I heard the first time, that mocking noise. Not so much an aggravated noise this time, more so a noise that gave me the impression it was having fun, or enjoying the fear we blatantly had in our voices. No more footsteps, but my friend shot in its general direction again. Ears were ringing again, I couldn't hear anything but I could see a small glimpse again of it running off deeper into the woods. Could only see its rear for a second or two before it was too far to be seen by the light. This meant it had to be running pretty fast. I don't want to give a number, but if I had to guess, it was easily around 20 miles an hour or so. Nothing a human could do on all fours, that's for damn sure. We turned around and jogged back home. Upon getting home, we talked about what we saw. Nobody was disputing my story now. We had all seen it. We talked all night. But we did all agree that if this was paranormal, that a crawler was the best guess we had. Now we're all on the same page. We still don't know if we buy into all the paranormal claims, but this one is starting to convince us. We realised at the end, we hadn't even looked for pictures. We asked my friend on the phone and he shyly admitted he hadn't even thought to take a single picture. I'm not gonna lie guys, I was so terrified I didn't even open the camera app a single time. I was just trying to make sure it wasn't behind us or charging us. I'm sorry. We told him not to worry. None of us would have been any better about being calm enough to set up a picture. I never saw its face still, but the friend who took the shot swears it didn't have one, or at least had no eyes. He couldn't see if it had a mouth, but it was about one third out from behind the tree, and from his angle, he saw it was blank from the nose area up. Rivet did have eyes, it was too black to be noticeable in the dark. We did all decide though, we're going to go back. We'll be more prepared next time. We'll do our research. We have a camera strapped to us or always recording. We know what to expect, so we'll be more calm. Any other tips or advice, please let me know. We'd really like to capture some full on evidence of this thing.
I haven't had much time for leisure with work recently. Been having to accept some pretty awful shifts to get by with COVID times. So I've lost my ability to go on my evening walks, which were a method of stress relief for me. It had been a while since I'd gone on one, so three nights ago, I decided to just go for a late night walk. I put on my headband flashlight and decided to take a path I hadn't in ages. There's a small trail near the back of my neighbourhood that goes about four miles deep into the woods. My plan was to walk about one and a half miles in and take the parallel path to come back. I make it down to around 1.3 miles, according to my Fitbit, and I start getting that feeling I'm being watched. I turn off my headlights and sit still to listen. At this point, I'm more concerned there's a guy following me who's up to no good. I heard clear footsteps in the leaves off the trail, and they've been behind me for nearly five minutes. I stopped thinking it was an animal or another walker and became worried. Sitting there for probably three to four minutes and I hear nothing at all, I turn back on my headlights and decide to start walking quickly back home. About two minutes later, I hear footsteps again. This time it sounds different. It sounds like four feet instead of two feet walking, and it's walking at the same increased speed I am. I turn around quickly with my headlights and my phone lights and point it behind me. Silence. I get angry and yell out, leave me alone, I'm going to call the cops, and if you come at me, I have a knife. Silence. I yell again to get the fuck out of here and start walking towards where I heard the walking. About 20 yards out, hard to fully make out because the flashlight doesn't reach too far, I see what looks like a literal naked man running full speed on all fours into the woods. Normally I'd chalk that up to drugs, but my area does not have a drug problem and there were some details that led me to believe it wasn't a person. For one, they were damn near hairless, completely bored, pale white skin, and the way it ran on fours looked natural. Not like when you try to run on all fours and look stupid, it looked like its bone structure was designed to walk on all fours. There was no hunched look, their back was flat and they were fast. Last thing that happened was straight out of a horror movie. I hadn't heard anything in a while on my way back, but kept turning around to be sure. With about 0.3 miles left to go until I was in the clear, I heard a mad dash through the leaves. I whip around and it stops on a dime. I see the edges of its head behind a tree and yell loudly to try and intimidate. What I heard next, I'll never forget in my entire life. It cackled like a monkey, a noise I've literally only heard in nature documentaries. The tone was that of a mockery, a predator having fun with me. I didn't stick around. I sprinted as fast as possible back home. I'd love to believe this was some prank or some rabid, bored, diseased coyote, but I got a pretty clear look at it. It wasn't. It had human feet and human hands, a human head and a human buttocks, but nothing else about it was human. I called the cops after and told them that the man was following me. I didn't want to say some creature because they'd think I'm crazy. They didn't find anything, but they did see quite a bit of activity in the leaves and dirt, about 50 feet from where the trail was, leading far back into the woods before it got to a large stretch of grass where no footprints were seen. I moved into that home around nine years old and moved out at 13. It was a very old house. Victorian age, but not as beautiful as the ones that come to mind. It was run down, but big and cheap, and my parents wanted to build onto it. An older married couple died in the kitchen at that house. They tried to keep warm by laying near the stove, but it didn't work. The house was also built on top of a cemetery. If anyone's curious, it was called the Boneyard in Houghton, Michigan. Anyways, the second I went to the upstairs of that house as a kid, I felt a presence I hated. It made me want to cry. I was nine. Ghosts were never a thought in my mind. I just knew I didn't like the feeling. I cried to my mom about how I wanted to sleep in the living room. It was my safe place. I didn't feel watched and was scared. I ended up crying every time to the point where we had a mattress in the back of the living room for me to sleep. It went on until I was 11. When I used to go up there to grab anything, I would cover my ears and repeat what I'm doing, such as, I'm grabbing my pants, I'll leave right after, I promise. And I felt like I was being stared at. I never actually heard voices, 
but I felt like my ears were heavy if I didn't plug them. More stuff happened in between, but once I turned 11, I slept upstairs for the very first time, because my parents thought it was ridiculous. At first it was hard, but then I ended up just trying to pretend it was me. Keeping in mind my best friend felt the same way, we both swear it till this day, and my parents admitted they felt the same once we moved out. Okay, skipping to the point. I had no door in my room, it was just a walkway. I knew something was there every night. Eventually when we moved, I was 14 now, at this point a year of my new home. I had a long dream of me watching my younger self sleep. The whole dream of me tossing and turning, everything was detailed. I was standing at the doorway and there was nothing else to the dream, just my younger self laying there. I knew it could just be my subconscious thinking about it and it came into my dreams. But it sticks to me to this day. It made my experiences there feel more real, if that makes any sense. I know it sounds like I was young and it's whatever, but I'm 20 years old now. I remember the feeling, the stories, it's all vivid. It will never leave my mind. And at that age, my parents never let me around ghost stories, scary movies, or anything of that sort. We both went to bed, as normal, and the night felt really strange. I just had a feeling that I couldn't really describe. Anyways, I closed my eyes and went to sleep. Randomly during the night I woke up and rolled on my side, and standing next to my bed was some little kid, grey skin, black eyes, etc. Note that I rarely ever wake up during the night. Anyways, this kid yelled out to me and said, this is my house. The voice was quite deep. Then I yelled back and said, no, this is my house, and then it disappeared. It was so weird. My girlfriend didn't hear me yell back either, which makes me feel like it was some ultra-realistic dream. I could confirm that it wasn't sleep paralysis, otherwise I wouldn't be able to roll on my side and lean up to communicate to this thing. Then I woke up the next morning, no sign of the entity or whatever it was. Maybe it left me alone because it knows that I'm taking good care of the house. I have no problem with it at all been really quiet lately. If it understands who I am or understands that I keep the house in good condition, maybe it'll leave me alone. It's always welcome here, just as long as it doesn't harm us in a way. I'm 6'8", nothing will run through me. However, a spirit or something demonic will always have the power. Immediately after the car accident that started all of this, I was in the hospital getting patched up. On the third day, the doctors were starting to reduce the quantity of painkillers and sedatives they were pumping into my system, and I started to experience longer periods of lucidity. As shift change, a new nurse came in to care for me. He introduced himself, cracked a joke, and I felt connected to him immediately. He was obviously great at his job and skilled at calming people down, while they went through the most traumatic experience of their lives. He told me he'd be back to check on me soon, showed me how to use the call button and left the room. Almost immediately, I started feeling an immense amount of pressure on my head, which I can only describe as the feeling in your ears during aggressive altitude changes. I hope I'm describing this in a useful way. It's super hard to describe. I felt like someone was yelling at me. Imagine what it feels like to be screamed at, but the room was silent except for the mechanical noises of the machines I was connected to. This feeling grew and grew steadily for about an hour, until I felt like I couldn't take it anymore. Without knowing what else to do, I opened my mouth and verbally said, please back away, you're crowding me. To my surprise, the sensation lightened some. I said thank you out loud and felt even more relief. At this point, I started to get the impression that I was feeling a female presence. Again, I cannot explain why I knew this. I did my best to relax into the feeling and I started to feel like I was getting more information. I felt confident I was speaking to a woman named Anne or Anna who had died in an adjacent room a few days ago. I felt that she wanted me to thank the male nurse for preserving her dignity as she passed. About this time, the nurse walked back into the room and started checking my vitals. My heart was racing and he noticed. He asked if I was feeling okay and I told him that I was. I couldn't bring myself to bring this up to him. 
I felt like I was losing my mind. He left again, and the feeling of pressure intensified continuously until he returned an hour later. By this point, I felt like I would burst if I didn't comply with this request. So I'd said something to the effect of, listen, I know this sounds insane, and I'm mostly telling you this so that you can identify if I'm having a mental break or not. Ever since you walked into this room, an older woman has been asking me to thank you for helping her pass with dignity. I will absolutely never forget the look on his face as long as I live. A handful of emotions flashed across his face. Shock, fear, suspicion, and then, to my surprise, empathy. He said, I know exactly what you're talking about. Is she here now? I told him that she was, and he said, You're welcome, ma'am. I hope you're feeling better. My head exploded. I had never told him that I thought her name was Anne or Anna. As soon as he left the room again, I immediately felt better. I never ran into Anne again during my stay in the hospital, but Mike, the nurse, worked my room as often as he could during the next three months while I was there. This was my first experience I had after my NDE, and since then, I have literally thousands of experiences. As I said, as I get a moment or two here and there, I'll add some more stories for you guys. I know how crazy this stuff sounds, and half the time, I think I'm nuts. During the aftermath of the accident that nearly killed me, I was given nearly unlimited access to opioid painkillers. This was years before the opioid epidemic that has ravaged this country came to light, and doctors were giving out Percocet freely. As a direct result, I was addicted to these drugs and spent a number of years dulling my senses. I've come to believe that the drugs were interfering with these abilities, and I can't recall any meaningful experiences through this period. In retrospect, I can't help but wonder if dulling these experiences made the drugs feel that much better. Fast forward about five years, I've gotten clean. I met a girl who would become my wife and the mother of my child. We had been dating for a few months, and I had been fighting the urge to share this with her. I was falling in love, and I was afraid that she'd think I was crazy and withdraw. For weeks, I'd been getting very insistent messages that her late mother wanted me to pass along. She hadn't fully processed her mother's passing, understandably, and she'd been coping with destructive behaviour up to the point we met. After weeks of constant pressure when we were together, my ability to fight was waning, and I finally decided that I had to take the risk and tell her about my abilities, even if that meant her pushing me away. I knew that I had to tell her, but I wanted to be sure that I approached the conversation in a way that would give me the best chance of convincing her without pushing her away. I decided that asking her mother to share something with me that I could use to validate the fact that I was telling the truth would give me the best chance. It would have to be something that I could never know, that no one else could know. Being in proximity to the living person sharpens the messages and provides better clarity. So I decided that the next time we were together, I would speak with her mother and ask her to give me something indisputably. A few hours later, I was sitting in her bedroom with her and worked up the courage to get it over with. I went through an exercise I used to open. I can show if anyone's interested. Usually, thinking of a deceased person brings them to me, and this day was no different. I asked her mom to share something unique with me, and held myself open to receive whatever she decided to share. Two things happened immediately. Firstly, I was overwhelmed by a floral scent which her mother told me was a blackberry scented lotion she loved and wore every day. Secondly, I immediately began rubbing the pad of my pointer finger and my thumb compulsively. Her mother didn't explain this, but assured me that it would mean something to her. Now comes the tricky part. How do I start this conversation? If you have a gift like mine or think you might, you may have found yourself asking a similar question. It's a constant struggle. I fought with it for about an hour and finally decided to go for broke. I can't remember now exactly what I said. This happened in 2010, but I said something like this. So listen, the next few minutes are going to be strange. I need you to hear me out and then, if you want me to leave, I will. She was obviously concerned, but agreed to hear me out. So I continued. You know about the accident I was in when I was a teenager? You've seen the scars. But there's one other lasting symptom. Since that day, 
I've got some messages from the other side every day. Every time we are together, I have someone trying to get through to you and I can't fight it anymore. I'm afraid this will scare you away, but I have to share this with you if we're going to be together. To her credit, she assured me that she could handle it and knew me well enough to know that I wasn't crazy or a liar. I decided not to come right out and say that I was speaking with her mother because I wanted her to make that connection on her own. She told me to go ahead and I started with the scent. I told her that I was overwhelmed by the sense of blackberries and she was immediately crying. She went to her bathroom and rummaged around under the sink for a while. She came back with a bottle of the lotion that her mother had when she died. She wasn't able to bring herself to throw it away. She opened the bottle and we both sniffed it. I confirmed that this was the smell I was getting. Then I showed her the finger and thumb thing. She laughed out loud and smiled huge. Her mother had used this gesture to poke fun at her grandmother, who was always fondling a rosary using the same motion. She got a good laugh out of this, and I could not have asked for a better validation. Her mom really nailed it. I took this to mean that her mother approved of our relationship. Those on the other side can see all our deepest secrets and have full transparency into our lives. The fact that her mother helped me convince her that I was telling the truth meant a lot to me. As she could have easily sabotaged me if she didn't want us together. I spent the rest of the night facilitating a conversation between my girlfriend and her deceased mother, which was long overdue, and helped her grieve in a way that she hadn't been able to before. We got married in 2013 and welcomed our daughter in 2016. We've been happily married for nearly 10 years, and her mother is a constant presence in our house. How do spirits communicate with me? People often ask me if I see dead people, and thankfully, the answer is mostly no. Every once in a while, I'll see a person on the street that looks different to me, really hard to explain, and after asking my wife, she'll tell me that she didn't see anyone matching my description. This most often happens to me in the car for some reason, no clue why. People also ask me if I hear audible voices, and again, thankfully, the answer is mostly no, with some exception. In general, spirits don't speak to me at all. Most commonly, spirits insert imagery into my head, and that they mean to be representative of the concept they want me to share with their living friend or relative. As an example, if his deceased father was a mechanic in life, he may show me a wrench or a car, or something else that he thinks will make sense to his child. If a person was a drug addict in life that played a role in their death, they might show me a syringe or some other paraphernalia. I also have some empathetic ability, so a spirit might impress upon me the feeling of love, guilt, or anything else they want their loved one to understand. My particular gifts are not great with names or numbers. It's very rare that I'll completely and correctly get a name. Much more commonly, I'll get a first initial or a nickname or something else that validates for the person I'm reading that I'm communicating with a specific person. Numbers are also tricky. As an example, if someone asks me how old a loved one was when they passed, the best I can generally do is arrange. This person was a teenager, etc. People often ask me for guidance on the future, and my personal experience has been that the other side has very little to offer as it relates to the future. I believe that the future is too variable, based on individual choice, for any accurate, consistent prediction. That being said, I've heard other e mediums claim the ability to predict the future to one extent or another, and I think that's totally possible. That isn't, however, my personal experience. I sure do wish my guides would share the Powerball numbers with me, though. My gifts are super visual in my mind, so as a result, I have had an abnormally high level of success describing people and places, that I've never seen or been to. One complication though is that spirits must describe themselves and often describe themselves as they were when they were younger and more self-confident. In rare instances, a spirit will show me what they look like near death if doing so will help to validate their loved one, but that's rare. More commonly, a person who died in their 50s might show me an image of them in their 30s. This can, at times, make it harder to validate if I'm describing a fit man with black hair in his 30s, 
but a person's husband passed away with grey hair in his 60s, that can be understandably confusing. It's important to keep in mind that each person's gift is unique, and each medium is giving different gifts. My gifts require a high level of interpretation at times, which complicates things for me. The opening of many doors. This exercise is one that I've developed in the 17 years that I've been dealing with this. Firstly, a quiet, comfortable place helps immensely. You can do this anytime, any place, but doing it in a quiet, dark room will help. I'll close my eyes and picture a door in my mind. I spend a substantial amount of time visualizing an extremely intricate door. I think about the details, the hardware, the embellishments, everything. I imagine this door standing in a black void with no consideration to where this door may be. Once I have a very clear and detailed image of the door in my mind, I imagine myself stepping forward, opening the door, passing the threshold and pulling the door closed behind me. Once on the other side of this first door, I imagine a second completely different door. I repeat all the steps above numerous times until I've passed through many different doors. I believe that each of these doors represents increasingly deep levels of consciousness. The number of doors and amount of time spent on the exercise varies depending on my level of focus, environment and mental state, but I normally spend between 10 and 30 minutes doing this before I attempt to read someone. I know that I'm down when spirit messages begin coming through loud and clear. It's important to note that this exercise can also work in reverse. If I'm feeling particularly overwhelmed, I'll use this exercise to quiet things down. The only difference when I'm trying to close is I'll imagine the doors starting with the doors open and I'll step through and close them behind me. I don't normally do this after every reading, but after a particularly emotional reading or after a very loud day, I may use this to wind down and protect myself. After I shared my gift with my wife, she was understandably excited to have a psychic medium for her boyfriend and proceeded to embarrass me repetitively by using my gifts to spook her friends and family. This ended up being a blessing in disguise, as though it was nerve-wracking to continually explain my gifts and risk ridicule. It also gave me a chance to develop my gifts in a way that I never had before. I'd spent the majority of my energy trying to ensure that no one ever found out, but now, I was beginning to explore the possibilities. One of the first people my then girlfriend outed me to was her cousin, who'd been more like a sister to her their whole lives. I'll refer to her as Becky throughout this story to keep things clear. This reading was different from the one I did for my wife. Most notably, I was aware that my wife's mother had passed. I knew her name, etc. This would be completely different, as I wouldn't know in advance if Becky hoped to contact a man or woman or what her relationship to that person would be. The additional variables add to the internal conflict and make it even harder to decide which direction to go. One of the biggest problems that my gifts present for me is that it can be really hard for me to tell what is a message from spirit and what is my own thought. For the first time during this reading, I decided to try a new tactic. I used a notepad to write down everything that came through my mind without second guessing it. And afterward, I let her review all of my notes and determine for herself what was important. This worked out extremely well, and a number of the things that I would have talked myself out of sharing were important to Becky. In fact, some of those things were the most important things of the reading. I settled down to connect with Becky's deceased loved one. Another question I get a lot is, why do certain people come through and others do not? Or why does one person come through before another? The truth is that I have no idea why that is. I have some thoughts, such as people with some level of intuitive gifts in life tend to be better communicators in death. And someone that is newly dead needs to learn to communicate, like a baby learning to talk. Those reasons might be a factor, might not, who knows. Sometimes one person is just more pushy than another. In this case, I was immediately approached by an elderly redhead that wanted to make it clear to me that she was Becky's maternal grandmother. This woman was an expert communicator, and luckily she had a name that was easy to create a visual for. 
She gave me a rose, and as I wrote the word down on my notepad, Becky immediately gasped and covered her mouth. As I would soon find out, Becky's maternal grandmother had been called Rose. As Rose and I started to connect more deeply, it became clear that I was in for an adventure. This lady was a lot. Rose started bombarding my mind with a series of images so quickly that I had trouble keeping up and writing things down. She started by showing me an image of herself, and I started writing down descriptives like mid-40s, crazy red hair, short and sinewy, etc. Becky was reading as I was writing, and it was clear to me from her expression that some of what I was writing was spot on, but other things were off. I asked her to help me understand her expression, and she mentioned that Rose was in her 70s when she died. I explained that people show me what they want to, to present, and that often people make themselves look younger. This made her laugh because in life, Rose had never been honest about her age. Rose went on to show me dancing, specifically doing the twist, which it turns out she had done every week up to the week she died. Rose proceeded to share a handful of more mundane validations before taking things in a darker direction. She showed me the letter J, which it turns out was a reference to her husband, who was still alive at the time. She showed me bruises, which indicated to me that their relationship had been less than happy at times. Rose then showed me a dove, which was a common sign spirits used to indicate a desire for peace, or to let their loved ones know that they are at peace. When I wrote J and then Dove and Peace, Becky's face soured and she explained that her grandfather's name was Joe and they were estranged due to his treatment of her grandmother. She snared that the thought of making peace with him was unimaginable. A week later, Becky was riding a public transportation bus and who would walk onto that bus but her grandfather Joe? She hadn't seen him in years and the coincidence was unnerving to her. She couldn't force herself to speak to him, and he didn't notice her, but it was odd nonetheless. The reading ended with Rose playing a song in my head, You Are My Sunshine, which was a song she would sing to her children when they were young, and later her grandchildren. Becky referred to her own mother as Sunshine for this reason, and with that, Rose stepped back. Not only was that reading validating for Becky, it was really important to me too. As I've said before, I'm my own biggest critic and often battle with feelings of imposter syndrome. The fact that I was currently able to identify, describe and communicate with someone that I hadn't known and had no way of knowing about beforehand was instrumental in my increasing confidence. The strength of my abilities and my accuracy are both deeply connected to my confidence and willingness to suspend disbelief. And many of the readings I've done since then were even more intense. In the summer of 2012, my wife and I decided to go to the shore for the weekend. We would be staying with her brother and his girlfriend, now my sister-in-law, who I refer to as Jimmy and Anne, at Anne's shore house. The house belonged to Anne's grandparents, which will come into play later. In addition to me, my wife, Jimmy and Anne, we would also be joined by Becky, my wife's cousin, and another of my wife's cousins who I'll call Joe. Joe brought along his friend Matt, who I had met once before. Pretty much as soon as we arrived, my wife outed me to her brother. She told him about the experience we had shared with her late mother, his mother too, and about the reading I had done for Becky. Becky confirmed everything my wife said, but Jimmy was understandably hesitant to believe anything he was hearing. Anne was present during the conversation and immediately jumped in, asking, do you feel any spirits in this house? I told her that nothing was jumping out at me, but I'd be willing to try and do a reading for her later that evening, half hoping that she'd forget. Her eyes lit up, and I knew I wouldn't get that lucky. We all settled in and unpacked, at which point Joe and Matt arrived. We started drinking and proceeded to have a really great night. We drank a lot. We had a barbecue, we played drinking games, and then ended up all skinny dipping in the bay. At one point, Jimmy fired up a neighbour's jet ski, naked, and did a few laps around the bay. Needless to say, it was a ton of fun. We got back to the house, cleaned up, and settled in to drink some more and chill out. Not more than 10 minutes after we settled into the couches around the living room, 
Anne reminded me about my promise to try a reading for her. This was obviously news to Joe and Matt, who hadn't yet arrived when my wife and Becky were telling the stories earlier, so we had to go back through all that and bring them up to speed. I agreed and started my exercise to open up for reading. Almost immediately, I started receiving messages from spirits. I was approached by a man who appeared to be in his late thirties. He had grey hair beginning to grow in his temples, a sharp nose and a receding hairline. I started to describe him and Anne recognised him and didn't seem surprised in the least that he was the person that would step forward. This was her late uncle Calvin. The house we sat in belonged to her grandparents, who had been Calvin's parents. Calvin had lived at the Shaw house in the months preceding his death. There were no pictures of Calvin in the house, as his parents were still heartbroken about his passing and couldn't bear to look at them. Anne started rifling through a nearby drawer and produced a photo of four men in baseball jerseys. She asked which of the floor was Calvin, and I was able to pick him out of the photo easily. This impressed everyone in the room, but I had a quarter chance, not that impressive, to me at least. I asked Anne for a notepad and started writing the messages I was receiving from Calvin. He started by showing me a very strange image. I took it to myself but wrote purple octopus as he was showing. Anne reacted visually, then said, no fucking way, I dressed as a purple octopus one year for Halloween when I was four or five. Clearly, I couldn't have known this. I pressed on with the reading, but noticed that Jimmy, Joe and Matt were all paying closer attention now. I proceeded to write a number of things on the page, including pills, shower, shore, tools and south side. Calvin stopped there, and I took that to mean that he wanted me to show Anne before moving forward. After reading my notes, Anne went on to tell me that Calvin had battled addiction for years before his death. He had died under slightly mysterious circumstances, and was found dead in a motel shower at another shore point, a few hours from where we were. She also told me that he had lived on the south side of the largest local city, and had been a tradesman in life. She asked if I could work with Calvin to provide some clarity around his death, so I asked Calvin to show me things that might help clear up the mystery. Calvin proceeded to show me a sequence of images, which I interpreted and started writing. I wrote drugs, friend, accident, fear, and shame. Then Calvin did something that no other spirit had done for me to that point. I saw in my mind's eye that he had been on a bender with a friend. He got too high and decided to take a shower to try and sober up a bit. He slipped in the shower and on the way down he smashed his left temple on the soap holder and went unconscious, doing significant damage to his skull and brain. A few minutes later his friend found him dead in the shower and decided not to call for help, fearing that he would face legal issues due to the drugs they'd both been taking. I wrote fell, shower, left temple, brain damage. I also got the distinct impression that Calvin didn't want Anne to feel guilty in relation to his passing. I felt strongly that Calvin wanted me to tell her that there was nothing she could have done. I shared all of the above with Anne, who promptly devolved into an emotional sobbing state for about 10 minutes. When she composed herself, she confirmed that everything I had said to that point was absolutely correct. The most astounding thing to me personally was that I had correctly detailed his manner of death. Down to the location of the injury, her family had wondered whether Calvin's friend's decision had cost him his life, and it gave us some peace to know that it wouldn't have mattered. She also shared with me that the night Calvin died, he had texted her, but she hadn't answered. Coincidentally, Anne was in the same shore town at the time, and was the person who had identified Calvin's body. She had always felt tremendous guilt that she hadn't answered him, and had wondered if things would be different if she had. Calvin began to step away, and I thought we were done for the night. But oddly, another man stepped forward and started communicating with me. Everyone was pretty shook at this point, but you can't really turn this stuff off, so I tore off the page of notes from Calvin and started a new page. This man was quite large, and showed himself wearing a US Postal Service uniform. I found this oddly specific, and said to no one in particular, Calvin has stepped back, but does anyone know a portly man that was a mail carrier in his life? Matt's head snapped around and he said, that's my uncle. 
Matt's uncle, whose name was Chris, went on to validate a few other things that he had driven a unique, large truck in life. The fact that he was married to Matt's maternal aunt and that he had died of a heart attack. This particular part of the reading was extremely impactful for me personally because I didn't know a thing about Matt. There was no possible way that I could have provided that level of detail that I had. This made me much more confident. So my boyfriend is out of town for the week and I've got the apartment to myself. I spent yesterday cleaning and playing a retro video game and then went to bed around 3 a.m. We've known for a while that our apartment is haunted and as I've said before, it's just a block away from a graveyard. Anyway, I always sleep facing the wall that our bed is up against with just a pillow between me and it. My dog sleeps on his bed, which is at the foot of our bed and the cat has a bed under a table which we have our air conditioner on because its hose doesn't reach the window without it. And yes, I know single hose units are terrible. I woke up around 5.30 a.m. and saw a hand in front of me on the bed. It looked like a normal hand or arm coming out from under the blankets, but there wasn't really room in front of me for someone to be laying there. I grabbed the hand, I don't know why, and I felt it jump like it startled whoever it was attached to. Then I heard a voice come from under the bed saying, huh? My dog and cat bolted out of their beds and ran out of the room. Then the hand just vanished and I was laying there holding nothing. I had a feeling that I shouldn't reply, though whatever, and went back to sleep. I don't know why I felt impelled to grab the hand and I don't know why it didn't scare me. Maybe my pre previous experiences with disembodied voices and shadow people? I know I wasn't dreaming because I could read the clock. And when I'm dreaming, I have a sort of hazy pressure feeling. And I know it wasn't sleep paralysis because my pets reacted to it. Maybe one of our ghosts? Big things never happen when my boyfriend is home. The occasional light will turn on or off and the cupboards sometimes open and close themselves. We've seen a shadow peek into our room, but we've never felt like we were in danger from the usual stuff. I had a really hard time sleeping last night. My partner had an early morning and our three-year-old passed out. I finally fell asleep around 4am. I'm jolted awake by my three-year-old yelling about something. He wanted the hallway light back on. No one else can sleep like this. I'll shut my door until he falls asleep, then turn the light off and open my door. I looked at my partner who was sleeping still, yelled out to my son, which surprisingly didn't wake my partner and got up to turn the light on. I closed the bedroom door behind me so my partner wouldn't be blinded. I told my son to go back to sleep and walked around to the kitchen. It was 7.15am but there was no sunlight and it was quiet outside, way later than I expected. I walked through the Jack and Jill bathroom back to my bedroom to alert my partner he was late. When I got back to bed, it was empty. We must have crossed paths and he's in the shower. I go look, having a very unsettled feeling. Bathroom's empty. The house is empty except for my son and my dog, who's passed out throughout this event. I called my partner, feeling slightly nauseous and panicked. He stated he left the house at 6am. No one woke up, not even the dog, which he noted was super strange. We laughed, and I attempted to go back to sleep until my son woke back up. I never was able to sleep, and haven't been able to shake this feeling that something isn't right. Growing up, we lived in a small two-up, two-down council house in a rural town. The house dated back to maybe the 30s or 40s, and we knew that the last occupants had been an older lady with a black Labrador. I think the neighbours told my parents about her, and our door number had a black lab on it also. I wouldn't say that the house was really badly haunted, but a few strange things happened to us over the years. My family was mum, dad, myself and my younger sister. Mum and dad were also into spirituality and mediumship at the time, although they kept that part of their lives as separate as possible from us as young children. Whether or not that affected activity in the house, I don't know. My mum had a few strange experiences that I only heard about later on, 
and she wouldn't want to frighten us while we lived there. I remember playing in the front room and when I heard my mum scream out as she was going up the stairs. We all ran to get to her as we thought she'd fallen. Mum was fine, just shaken, but she wouldn't tell us what had made her scream. I had a young kid's attention span, so I went back to my dolls or toys and largely forgot about it. Later on, my mum told me that she had been carrying washing up the stairs and had nearly tripped over a large black dog that just appeared and then disappeared on the middle step. This happened twice, I think during a span of maybe 10 years. She also saw our lovely ginger cat on the stairs, who'd been hit by a car and passed away a few months back. My parents told me that when I was maybe six or so, I used to tell them about an old man or lady who used to visit me at night and stand over my bed. I have no recollection of this, which is strange, but maybe I just blanked it out. By far the strangest thing that happened to myself and my younger sister, I was eight and she was seven. My parents didn't know anything about this, as being kids, we didn't really say anything about it too much. Looking back now, I can see how strange and creepy it was. Me and my sister shared a bedroom with a bunk bed. We would periodically swap bunks over depending on what mood we were in. The wall height was relatively small, so the top bunk was pretty close to the ceiling. Whilst I was in the top bunk, I would often hear heavy footsteps echoing across the attic floor. They would start at one end of the room and stomp, stomp, stomp across to the other. If I put my hands out, I could feel the vibrations through the wall. I think the first time it happened, I called for my dad. And of course, by the time he came up, it had stopped. This happens a fair few times over the years, and my sister heard it too. Eventually, we just ignored it. The only way up into the attic was through a small hatch in the bathroom ceiling. The bathroom was next to our room on the small landing. I know my parents were both downstairs, so I'm not sure what it could have been. Anyway, one morning my sister and I were playing in our room. Our dad had gone to sleep in the bedroom next door and he was tired. He suffered from insomnia and mom was out working that day. We both heard a strange click come from the bathroom and then a strange gargling sound voice started talking to myself and my sister. For the life of me, I can't really remember what it said only that it made us laugh a bit. It was fairly loud, and it sounded like my dad's deep voice, but as if it had been out through some weird echoing gargling filter. We were convinced it was our dad, as he used to put in strange voices to make us laugh. Something definitely felt off though, and I do remember that it asked us to go to the bathroom. We just looked at each other at that point and didn't move. The voice carried on for a bit, and at one point, I think we both laughed quite loudly. It was then my dad woke up, quite cross, and demanded to know why we were both being so loud. We told him that he had been making us laugh, resulting in some confusion, as we thought the voice had been him all along. He went back to sleep, uttering dire warnings about us waking him up again. There was, then it was quiet for a bit, and eventually you heard dad snoring. At this point, we were both feeling quite scared, and being kids, we hid under the duvet and stayed silent. There was a loud click from the bathroom again, and then the weird gurgling sounding voice started up once more. We did scream out for dad and woke him up again, and he was not happy at all, thinking that we had both been silly. We all went downstairs and kind of forgot about it for a while. My sister swears blind that she can't remember this. However, a few years ago, we found a box of old stuff, including her old diary. We were going through it for a laugh, when we came across an entry that spoke of how frightened she had been when a weird goblin voice spoke to us through the attic. She'd even drawn a little picture of us hiding under the duvet. Still no clue as to what it could have been to this day.